And uh, this is our third in our series of uh, intensive management uh, workshops. Um, well, first of all, I'd like to very much thank the ladies of the Kentucky Soybean Association Board uh, here at the office. Uh, Miss Debbie and Becky and Ray, they have done a phenomenal job uh, helping putting all this together. Um, with Miss Becky uh, being uh, the one in charge of making sure that I stay on message and keeping uh, this Zoom meeting uh, uh, working. So um, uh, these workshops are brought to you by the United Soybean Board and the Kentucky Promotion uh, Board. And um, I want to thank Ray. Um, I showed the group yesterday. Uh, I have a little commercial to read and it's in a font that I can see without having to find a pair of glasses. So um, thank you, Ray, for that. And so uh, the intensive soybean management workshop came about in 2014 after a group of farmer leaders decided meetings to tackle tough issues and explore problems we all face on the farm without having just the right product to fix those problems it was a great way to invest in your checkout dollars. Since its beginning, the soy checkoff has existed for one reason to create profit opportunities for Kentucky soybean farmers. Dr. Chad Lee has moderated these workshops for several years. And one thing he said that has really stuck with me, it's not about the beans in the bin, it's about the bucks in the bank. We like to focus on ways we can help increase our operations profitability. Sometimes that's driving yield and sometimes that's lowering input cost. Either way, we wanna help increase your bottom line. We talk a lot about sustainability, and while there's no standard definition of that term, I think a long-term profitability is one of the principles of sustainability. Just as we take care of the soil, the water, and air, we have to be good stewards of our operation and leave them financially healthy for the generations to come. In, in addition to driving yields and minimizing input costs, the checkoff is consistently constantly looking for innovation, new uses for our versatile crop. We call these crop opportunities. From feed to biodiesel to car tires, U.S. soybeans or U.S. soy has evolved into the ultimate raw material. Each of these numerous diverse uses began, began as a single crop opportunity. Cre creating crop opportunities, boy, it's kind of tough talk this morning. I should have had that second coffee in a state-by-state, country-by-country, innovation-by-innovation, around-the-clock mission. That's why the checkoff will always have an eye on the future, looking for the next crop opportunity that can make the difference in your bottom line. Simply put, a crop opportunity is your checkoff dollars at work. New revenue streams created, exist existing markets expanded, or revived in new and exciting ways that open up demand and drive sales for your soybeans. The Kentucky Soybean Board and United Soybean Board are pleased to offer intensive soybean management workshop to increase crop opportunities found on your operation. Now, I think Miss Becky has a real quick video to show, and then I will introduce our uh, speaker for today's workshop. Miss Becky. Soybeans in 60. Not just soy milk or edamame. U.S. soy is much, much more than that. In fact, you can't live without it. It's in your vegetable oil. It's in your everyday food. And it's in your food's food. It's in your cars and your trucks. It's in your home, your business, your business, and your play. U.S. soy can do all this and still produce more to feed a growing world in the most sustainable manner. We're U.S. soy, and we're honored to be a part of the global challenge of feeding the world. All right, uh, this morning we have Dan Coffin with SPNC Corp. 
um, Dan saw uh, a need for better programs than what the big corporations were offering at the time. And looking at the way that the earth was created and how it operates, he saw the best way to get the soil and plants to interact and perform uh, was to recreate their natural habitat for optimum growing conditions. So Dan's gonna kind of lead us in uh, a three-part um, program this morning. And um, at the end of each one, if you have any questions, um, type them into the chat and we'll, we'll get those to him. Uh, we're looking at how it breaks down today is how soils provide nutrition to plants and how does biological, bi the biological fit in, into and now, how the plants are influenced by foliar nutrition and how to create integrated programs to maximize soybean nutrition for higher yields. So at this time, uh, I'd like to introduce Mr. Dan Coffin. Dan, good morning, sir. Thank you, Jeff. You know, this is uh, this is interesting. I think what what uh, the new the new situation has given us here is uh, for those people who used to be scared to stand in front of people and talk. All you got to do is just have enough nerve to sit in front of your screen. Now you don't have to worry about all, what all those people look and think and say out there. You can just sit down and talk to hundreds of people at one time. It's great. Yep, it gets you over the fear of of staring into that mass crowd. If you, <laughs> I don't know, staring into a piece of a electronic equipment is about as bad. So. <laughs> Well, I'll see if I can get my uh, share screen here to work. Bring up the presentation. Do you see the uh, main screen now? Soybean nutrition, is that what's showing you? Dan, you're good. Good to go? Great. All right. Well, thanks, folks, for joining us here this morning. And um, I am kind of excited and uh, frustrated at the same time. Someone would say, well, if you've got three hours to spend on a topic, uh, how in the world are you gonna ever fill it? Uh, and I think one of the fun things about it and the, the challenging things is shortening it down to three hours because some of the stuff I'm gonna talk about today is directly applied uh, things that we're doing. And um, literally each one of these topics can go on for three and four hour seminars a piece. Uh, because we are in a day and age where it seems strange that here we are in 2021 and oftentimes we're limited to the information that we have that even in some cases goes back to the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s from nutrients and nutrient availability. And so my objective is to kind of give you, as, as Jeff said, a, a, a kind of a big picture uh, story of how this all fits together and how the soybean uh, fits into that one little part of the story because it's always a bigger story. And so that's why it's a comprehensive look at total fertility systems, because there's a lot of different things involved. So I'll give you the quick summary. Uh, as Jeff said, we have an overview of the current prevailing nutritional process is where I'm gonna start here briefly, and then we'll break it into three sessions. So at the end of the session, Hopefully have a little bit of time for some questions. If you need to get up and, and get a cup of coffee uh, or take a restroom break or whatever, uh, we'll break it a little bit. And so if there's some questions that we have between the sessions, we'll kind of answer them at that point. So the first session is on how soils provide nutrition to plants. The second session will be on how plants are influenced by foliar nutrition. And the third session will be how do we do some of these things together and make them fit into the big picture because ultimately that's really what we're looking for. So in the current overview of the current nutritional process for what we're doing, I think um, most people would agree still, that we're, we love to be able to still press the easy button in agriculture. And so the most common approach is, is to dry spread you know, granular fertilizers uh, with an emphasis um, on you know, more, more fertilizer uh, issues. And I, I, that, that's just common sense. We've done that for so many years when we started doing fertilizer, it's like, well, let's just go down, get some product, get it spread, you know, that'll, that'll fix That'll fix a lot of our situations here. And some of that works. And, and when we get back to the whole idea of what Jeff was covering there early with, with his uh, information, inform, instructional information, it's about return on investment. And I actually heard one of the guys the other day uh, from the CCA conference in Indiana from Purdue. And when he was looking at potash, he said, we have to learn that making applications of fertilizer has to be return on investment. If we're checking and finding we're not getting return on investment, why do we continue to do this? And I was about floored because it's been years since I've heard people actually talk that way. 
or some people actually mention it, but they don't really help us get where we want to go because it's like, well, eh, the plan's figured out anyway. We'll get, we'll get it, we'll get it straightened out. Uh, many times, uh, it's a one one time spread for the two year crop rotation. Uh, the idea in most cases, and many of you have heard this and still maybe still practice it. You know, we feed corn and let beans have the rest. Corn needs a whole lot more, so let's just give it to corn, and we'll let the beans have whatever's left over. You know, it's it's kind of a low input crop, but with a good return on investment if the prices are good. So it's kind of a makeup year for us. So you know, we'll do that. Um, the main nutrient focus is typically on extra potassium uh, fertilizer, uh, with some extra emphasis on phosphorus. In many cases, we may be putting out nine twenty three thirty something like that. But most of us have heard over time beans need a lot of potash, so we focus in on on potash typically. Some growers have now actually started including ammonium sulfate um, in this, especially if the spread is in front of the soybean crop, because they're recognizing that sulfur isn't free anymore. Um, beans obviously need some sulfur. Uh, all, all crops need sulfur, but beans, especially as, as, as uh, Sean Castile at Purdue uh, began to help us understand very late in the season. And so that has made a change. There are more seed treatments with more features um, in them hitting the market to help plants establish and grow. Um, not only with just fungicides and or insecticides, many of the new biological products or you know, plant growth enhancement products are being included now in seed treatments because they, they are used in such small, small quantities that about the most efficient way to deliver them is to put that in there. So in some cases, people are trying to throw in a little bit of fertility even with you know, that type of a seed treatment situation. Populations of planted stands have begun to drop a little bit, um, which allows improved branching and yield potential um, and reduce some of the input costs. I mean, seed has always been a very, very high input cost in, in the big picture. Um, it didn't used to be quite as bad, but now we've got technology in those seeds, they've gotten much more expensive. And, um, you know, as we begin to understand more and more about soybeans, by the time those soybeans are about three leaves tall, they've determined the total number of branches that they're going to have. And that kind of makes sense because if they're very small and they realize that they're interacting with a bunch of other plants around them and, and the space is tight, they tend to want to grow straight up in the air and they don't put on branches. But if they look around them and there's not much interaction with anything around them, they're like, oh, I must have all this space to myself. And so instead of growing so tall with a single branch, they branch out widely from the bottom. And we know more branches means more nodes and more nodes means more flowers. By the time those beans are five leaves tall, they've already determined the total number of nodes they're gonna have typically, unless we interact and do some other things we'll talk about today. And so one of the ways to potentially in, in improve nod, uh, node numbers is just reduce the stain within reason. And of course, many of us going back, if we remember no-till drills, 750 no-till drills, you know that was a common that was 160, 70, 80,000 to 220,000 because they weren't getting planted very well. And so with the advent of new, new technology and planters, some of that has allowed, it, uh, allowed us to drop those stands down. And finally, some have begun trying a little foliar product you know, in um, um, their sprays with the plan passes. They're making the pass anyway, looking into new things, new products and finding out, are there things that we can do um, as a part of and a connection to our old system, maybe with a little bit of our new system. So not everyone is doing that yet. And we'll talk about that here briefly. I think it's um, simple to ask yourself, and I heard this driving down the road one day, and I, I actually pulled over to write it down because it, it, it did make an impact. And this has been several years ago, but contrast is the mother of clarity. How do you know what looks, what wrong looks like until you know what right looks like? And I think this is some of the stuff that we're dealing with. We, we work in a, a system that is so elongated during a year, and we only have so many crops, and we stop to forget about wait a minute, if there's something that I'm looking at wrong or not understanding, where do I go to find it right? And I think that's where a lot of this has, has pushed me through the years because being, you know, growing up on a farm, being around agriculture all my life, I know farmers' eyes are in tune. They are master observers, if, if you really get down to it. And so as you start to observe things and pay attention to certain trends, what does right look like and where do I need to go to, to see that? Sadly, there is a disconnect in what we believe to be true and what is true. There are many, many things, many things, folks, in agriculture um, that we take for granted that in some cases, definitions have just been redefined or, or always talked about in the wrong sense. Um, for instance, between food and nutrition at all levels of the food chain, food versus elements, supplemental nutrient, nutrition and nutrients. 
um, you know, food is what food is, you know, and, and a lot of us like to call Doritos food and it is food, but let's face it. If we're looking for nutrition in Doritos, it's a very limited amount. We get carbohydrates, we get salts, we get some spices and seasonings, and it will make our stomach stop growling. But in terms of getting lots and lots of nutrition in that food, it doesn't exist there. And they can sprinkle stuff all over it and hope to make it look more nutritious if somebody desired to. But even when they do that, sometimes the nutrition does not get into our bodies. And so we, we have this whole idea of the difference between those two. Nutrient testing and soil sampling. I, I, I taught the uh, uh, plant for soil, uh, the soil fertility lab at Purdue University when I was getting my master's. I was a TA in, in the basic soils course and then was in charge of, of helping um, assist and do the actual fertility lab. So back when soil testing was still very, very um, uh, much involved at the universities, we were teaching people how that whole system works. And so when we do soil sampling, we're under the impression that it's giving us all the nutrient information that we need. Uh, and, and that's not exactly true. We'll, we'll go through that here in a few minutes. A nutrient release in the soil. And we have this idea that, you know, with a picture of the small plant on the right, if we just have nutrients in that soil, and we've all heard there's exchange capacity or holding capacity, that somehow the nutrients get in there and they stick. And then, you know, if water washes through something, why some of those nutrients just come off or the plant rubs into them, bumps into them, whatever. And so nutrient release in that soil is controlled first and foremost by what I put there. And then, you know, how good the plant is at digging around maybe and finding it. We, we, we don't understand any of that because we're not taught to think that way. Nutrient timing and growth. Um, every plant has its way. Every plant grows a certain way. And our nutrients need to be timed with that growth. But we're under the impression that as long as the nutrients are present, doesn't matter what they are, where they're at, the plant will figure that all out. And so growth can be something as simple as just, you know, putting a plant seed in there and turn it loose and it grow. And it will, it will grow and it will find some of the things it needs, regardless in some case of what things we've done. However, it will not maximize its growth and it will not maximize its, its yield potential. The nutrients themselves are still misunderstood. You know, oftentimes, and we hear this all the time, right? Nitrogen is nitrogen. Don't worry about, just get it out there. It doesn't matter whether it's urea or ammonium or nitrate or, or anhydrous, anything. Nitrogen is nitrogen, just get it out there and you know feed the system and let, let the plant get it done. It, everything will be fine. Just get enough nitrogen to get the job done, doesn't matter what form at all. And we spend all of our time getting you know good education sometimes in college and learning about all these different elements. It's like, well, wait a minute. Is there a difference? And the answer is yes, we're gonna cover that today. The total nutrients in the soil solution and root mass size. We think that the more total nutrients you get in the soil solution, the bigger the root mass will be. And in many cases, if there is a lot of extra nutrition, it's just the opposite. Because when plants start finding the things that they need and they're there in excess, they don't do much exploring anymore. So in many cases, if we overload the soil with too much nutrition, especially if it's nitrogen oriented, the plants don't grow uh, big, big, massive roots. They grow small roots because it's like, I'm not wasting my energy down here if stuff's coming to me. So it, it makes smaller roots. And so if you pull the, the levels down, you'll find oftentimes that it's like, wow, I don't know where these root masses came from. Well, it's just common sense. If the plant's not finding what it needs, it keeps digging and, and, and checking until it can. And then we have issues with, issues with nodulation, uh, disease problems, in, insect infestation. You know, if we, if we just double, triple, quadruple inoculate with, with rhizobium, we'll get way, way more nodule. Um, disease problems. Well, it's because disease is inherent everywhere in, in the entire system. And um, I just hope and pray I'm not in the right spot for disease to form. Well, disease is everywhere all the time. I mean, a lot of them are, are, are very prevalent. A lot of disease um, is simply nutritional deficiency. Uh, it, you know, we know a lot about what kills dairy cows. I think they, they know, know more about what kills dairy cows nutritionally about anything else on the planet. You know, a cow dies and they do a few tests. It's like, oh, you know, they had, it, had, it died from this, but the nutrients, you could tell, it didn't have enough selenium. It's all kinds of, all kinds of stuff like that. Insect infestation. Insect infestation, they see in a spectrum that we don't see in. And when they fly over the farms, it's almost like the pictures that the government takes of infrared during, during those stressful times when it's too dry. And you see all the different colors from reds to grays where the stress is on the hills and not in the lowland areas. 
insects see the same way. And when those plants get stressed, they burn sugars to fight that stress. And when they burn sugars to fight the stress, they fluoresce a different color. The insects fly over, they see all those different changes in colors. And where do you think they go first? Because we've always been told, it seems like insects always take out the weakest first. And those are the ones lowest in sugar. All of these things are connected. And so oftentimes it's all nutrient oriented, but yet we're not told that. So we don't stop to think about it. So if we knew there was an area along the outside of the fence near a side ditch or something that was a little dry and we were worried about mites coming in because it was getting dry. If all we did was treat those areas with some sugars and a little bit of insecticide, if insects did and mites did, for instance, come in, they wouldn't spread because they're not gonna go to the rest of the field if the field's in pretty good shape. So what kind of things um, do you read to get your information about your world? Um, I listed some of them over here that I'm familiar with, and it's not because I'm connected with any of them or anything else, and I'm not trying to say that any of them are bad. I mean, Prairie Farmer Publications have been with us for dec decades, successful farming, top producer. Um, if you're listening to me from, from Indiana or, or Ill Southern Illinois or something, and even in Kentucky, some of the guys get it, the in Illinois Indi Agri News newspapers. All these are top-notch publications. They're excellent publications and they report on the trends and they report on new releases, especially with the new ideas and new technologies that come out. And so this is where most of us are spending most of our time because that's the most, as we'd say, practical and maybe useful pieces of information that we can get. But the last piece down there on the bottom is really where I spend most of my time because how much of the info that you get is related to understanding soil and plant systems. You know, for decades, we were told, look, farmers aren't interested in this stuff. This is all too much science. And, you know, they need the day-to-day -day stuff. And that's what we're going to give them. And so we don't help you guys formulate ideas and thought processes to understand a soil plant system because you're really just only interested in the inputs and equipment. Now, there's a lot of truth in that. But I have run into many, many a farmer in the last 10 to 15 years as things have really gotten uh, complicated, complex, and tight. And we've just come through, you know, in the last couple, three years of a really tight economy. Um, and many of our young people that, you know, are with us now on the farm, they've never seen that before. Many of us have, you know, lived through it two or three times in our careers. But understanding the system is important. So, you know, what I have here in front of you is only 10 of the 25 to 50 books that I have on my shelf um, that I use in many cases as reference guides. Please don't believe that I sat down and read these things from cover to cover because this is not light reading. But what I'm looking at here is a group of things that actually help us understand just how complex and interrelated all of this stuff is. And each one of the pieces of the puzzle is connected to the next. The one that's right in the middle there, the Handbook of Microbial Biofertilizers. I bought that back in 2005 and I used to carry it around and I do meetings all over the country. And I would say to people, you know, this is where we're headed. And I would, hand, I would hold that up and show them and they'd look at me and shake their heads like, <laughs> I think this guy's finally lost his, he's off his rocker. He doesn't have any idea what's going on. Microbial biofertilizers, what does that even mean? Are we gonna use microbes and turn microbes into fertilizer? Well, there's a certain amount of truth in that, that that actually does happen. But the biggest piece that you're gonna find out is the microbes are the go-betweens between a plant, a living plant, and a, and a dead bunch of minerals to help those minerals melt the elements out of them and give them back to the plant. And that's what happens in the woods and the side ditch and the fence row and all the other places that don't get fertilized. That's how they sustain themselves. And so if we can figure out how to integrate into that system, some of the pieces, some magic starts to literally happen. And so all of these that you see um, are, are one piece of a great big puzzle. Now agronomy, um, I defined agronomy years ago um, in the realm that you see here in, in the, first, the first little sentence. I've always believed that agronomy is the study of plants and soils and how they interact to optimize productivity. There's an interaction with all this stuff. And I learned this, you know, many, many years ago. I, I got a, my master's is in, bachelor's was in um, plants and soils. And I have a master's in soils with an emphasis on agronomy, but a lot of other different courses along with it. And so the biggest problem we have is we have so many people who study one thing and they do it so well. And that's not to down anybody. I mean, everybody has their thing in life they're interested in. But so few people really integrate the information. And that's where we're starving to death out in the farm today is the integration of the information. And as you see, some of the folks at the university are beginning to, to work into that realm. And when you go to their presentations, they're so much more dynamic than they used to be because it's not just one thing. Agronomy can be car, car, um, compartmentalized, but it shouldn't be. 
Uh, because changes in one factor, such as fertilizer, seed, or chemicals in the, in the, the choice of farm inputs can have a big uh, impact on another factor. But oftentimes we rarely recognize it. Um, you see it today, like for instance, uh, when I talk to farmers, especially in the soybeans, that need to get control of mare's tail and water hen. Some of the PPO chemistry that we have out there today is really, really good at, ta at taking them out. And we need them. I mean, we cannot rely completely on a post program oftentimes just because of resistance issues or difficulty getting those chemicals in. So we switch to that chemistry, we must to keep control. But if we get a deluging rain in the first two or three weeks of the life of those young soybeans, and pray to God it doesn't happen the minute right after that, that we plant them, because there's a lot of injury that occurs. And those beans sit there for three weeks and do nothing. It's an average of somewhere between 15 and 25 bushel yield loss because the beans sit still for three weeks. How do you make up for three weeks of lost energy consumption when beans are far, far less uh, good at converting sunlight than corn and, and grasses ever thought about being. And they can't make up the time. Then when you lose three weeks, you've lost it. So I'll tell them, hey, look, all you got to do is add in an additional six or seven bucks into your program. If you get a rainfall like that, immediately call me. We'll put a program together. You foliar feed it once you get dry enough. It'll pop them right out of their funk. They'll take right off. And lo and behold, you know, guys pick up 10, 12, 15, 20 bushels at the end of the season compared side by side that are untreated. And it's not that it's 20 additional bushels. It's just that the bushels weren't lost. It's not like you're going from 60 to 80 or 100. It's like if I was going to get 60 with the rest of the crops around here that didn't get hurt, I still get the 60. I just didn't lose the bushel. We should always be evaluating the entire approach if we can to understand the impacts on the final productivity. Because it is a big system. It's a, it's a great big system that we utilize. And again, in many cases, we're not taught how to do some of that. We think we are when we try to control variables in a, in a test that we put out, but sometimes we've got two or three variables that we changed and we didn't think anything about it. And when we change those variables, we don't know which piece we're actually separating out. So it is a big picture. Everything that we do in these systems should fit into the retire, entire return on investment and not focus in on one or two areas like seed and fertilizer. The easiest thing for us to do is if, oh, we're dissatisfied with that particular variety. Um, so we change that variety and then all of a sudden it's like, well, it could have been my fertilizer program. So I changed this one little subtle thing. Um, and so when we do these kind of things, in many cases, we don't even get seed varieties anymore that last for years long enough to begin to figure them out about the time we do at the end of three years. The companies are, are really good about, you know, bringing the genetics to us and they're switching those genetics and just one sister change in a corn variety, for instance, it might still have the same male parent, but it's got a different female and, and it changes all the dynamics and we have to start over again. We need to ask more questions, don't we? We all know that we do, we need to do that, but we don't know what those questions are. And even if we do get those questions, oftentimes we ask them, but sometimes the answers just don't seem to exist. And if they do, where do we go to actually get the answers? Because I've been asked many times to answer a question and they do. And then if they go back and ask somebody else the same question, it's like, oh, I, I, there's not really an answer to that question. I don't know what he's talking about, but there's, there's no real answer to that question. Consider this. We all know the soil is designed to feed the plant because we put in fertilizers in soil. You know, we don't scatter it up in the air. We don't do strange things like that. We put it in the bands or we put it out here as a spread and we put it in the soil. So we know the soil is designed to feed the plant. But also consider this because 95% of us or more have never been told. The plant is designed to feed the soil or better yet, the microbial populations that are in that soil in return. Soils can't feed themselves. Microbes don't reach up into the atmosphere and just find food. They have to be fed because again, they're the go-between between, between a live plant and dead minerals. They produce acids and enzymes that actually melt these things out. And so believe it or not, our, our good researching people at Ohio State University, I think it was two years ago, actually, maybe it was three years ago now, told us that 20 to 25% of the photosynthates, the very sugars that photosynthesis produces in a plant is exuded out into the soil. Now think about that. That's a lot of losses if it doesn't have a purpose. A lot of losses. Why would that plant bother to feed microbes and soil bacteria and fungus? I mean, my goodness, aren't bacteria and fungus the bad guys? Why would I feed them? 
Well, the greatest percentage of soil microbes are not bad guys. They're good guys. And it's designed to try to keep a balance of the good guys, the beneficials, we call them, in conjunction with the bad guys. The bad guys are only bad when they get out of control in the wrong situation. For instance, when we see stock rod organisms in corn, we call them bad. But actually, they serve a purpose. Their, their purpose is designed to cause the stock to rot a little bit and get the ear to fall down to the ground so that the corn can continue to propagate its species. And it's actually those organisms are turned on by chemical signaling of the plant when the plant starts to um, uh, cannibalize and fire, we call it, it sends a signal out to the soil saying, look, it's coming near the end of the season. I need you to infect me so I, so I fall down. And then the disease continues to break down the stalks. And so, you know, a lot of stalk degradation comes from that. Same thing with soybean. But, you know, because it's out of sync with our production system, they're bad guys. And so now we're trying to annihilate them from the face of the earth, which, you know, some days is not so bad. But, you know, it's, it's up until we found the good beneficials to substitute for that, that we begin to have um, su success. Have you ever pulled out a fence row and farmed over it? <laughs> Many of us have, and more, more in the last recent years because of the way farms have been expanded. But you consider a fence row or a side ditch that you know, you've, you've tilled up, pulled out, and you plant over the top of it. What does the plant growth look like? So in the upper picture here, I realize you know, I, I've, uh, we are soybeans, but I brought this corn picture because I have one down below, but it wasn't quite as good. But I put the corn in here because where you have in the middle of the picture there, over the top of the old fence row, you, you see increased health, you see increased growth, you see larger leaf size, you see a lot more yield potential that's on the combine when you run the yield monitor over it. Um, and basically the increased microbial activity um, that's actually involved in that old fence row releases a lot of more nutrition from the soil and some more goodies from the plant. There's still organic matter that's been there for decades. There are microbes that are in a very diverse, diverse population and in very, very high numbers. And they're still interacting with that soil system around them in conjunction with that plant. And I'll have guys that actually mentioned like, wow, we've seen, you know, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40 bushels of, of corn and, you know, 10 to 20 bushels of soybeans without question over the top of that. And I'll ask them, have you taken a soil test in there? Because the numbers have probably got to be off the scale, right? Oh, that, that's a good point, you know, and they'll take the soil test and the numbers are in the toilet. I mean, you know, single digit phosphates very low levels of potassium, low levels of nitrogen in the available form, decent levels of micronutrients. It's balanced and it's loaded with biology and a balanced soil, high in biology, doesn't have high numbers on its soil test. And that throws them. I was gonna go and try to, to mimic these numbers, but I'm not gonna mimic these numbers. That looks like somebody who's mined their soil for the last 40 years who's just getting ready to sell it when he died. Strange, strange thoughts. Because that increase in efficiency has actually occurred because of the biology. So what you're seeing today is many of the companies that are jumping into this business, we dig around in, in that soil biology where it's rich and enriched. And we find certain microbes that we pull out and we start looking at them and we find out, wow, they have some very, very interesting characteristics that are very, very repeatable. And one microbe doesn't do just one job. It may have a hundred or a thousand different jobs it can do. And its main idea is just, figure out a way to make food out of something that it can find in the soil to grow its babies and, and, and repopulate. That's its main objective. In most cases, we use the plant because the plant will exude sugars and amino acids and feed us and sustain us and make us grow. So that's why they interact with plants. Plants send signals and they'll respond by, from those signals by releasing minerals around the soil for them. And the plant sends sugars its way and puts roots there and, and they grow their babies. The whole idea of this is if we can make it repeatable, which is where the technology is today, the new biotechnologies and biological technologies are different than the whole idea of what we thought snake oil was all about, because it's like, well, why did snake oil work one year and it didn't work the next year? Maybe you worked two years, then it never worked again. It's all in the fact that we're looking at microbiology, plant physiology, biochemistry, things that weren't measurable in the years past and now are. And so our idea is, if we move the fence row, if we find these microbes and we brew them up to really intense numbers, and we take those microbes that are doing so well in the fence row, brew them up and move them back to the farm row, part of that whole idea of the fence row effect now begins to come back to the farm row. And it's not out of the realm of reality to understand that if you can get 40 bushels of corn over here, is it hard to really get five or six or seven that more than, than pays for the, the costs involved? And so you see here on the bottom where the, where the, 
uh, posts are. This was a field that was taken out uh, about three or four years prior. So they, they marked where the old field boundaries were and where the fence line was. And you can see down through where the fence line was, the growth has improved all the way through the field. And so, so with the yield. Part of the reason why that's happening is because some of the microbes actually possess the ability to break down complex chemicals that we build into our pesticides and some of the chemicals that we put out and the carriers, oh my goodness, in many cases, the carriers last decades <clears throat> longer than the pesticides do. And so if we take certain groups of microbes that we understand can break down complex things like benzene rings and, and all kinds of other strange co concoctions that we thought should be easy to break down in the soil and they're not, we bring in those organisms. And in some cases, we can actually get side-by-side -side treatments now with the new biology where one, one row next to the other row that hasn't got anything in it is growing well, well, well above the other side. And in many cases, it's just due to bioremediation. It's just cleaning up the old junk that was putting a high level of stress on the crop and holding back the root masses. And by holding back the root masses, the amount of total nutrition coming in. And so when we change that and get rid of the junk, magically the plant grows much, much better. What's the number one thing that controls productivity in a soil? There's a lot of different things you can pick from, but the number one is air water management. Back in the 1990s, the north central states, you know, all through here through uh, Ohio, Indiana, all the way up into the um, to Minnesota, Wisconsin, out in the Dakotas and down to Iowa, Nebraska, all those states started doing connections to uh, crop soil and research and trying to put lists together of what was the top things. Ironically, in P and K, which is where we spend most of our time thinking about, on the list of the top 20, fell at number 16. And that's ironic. What does air water influence? Well, you can imagine as we're talking about a lot of this stuff with the microbes, life in the soil is critical to development of roots, root masses, changes in available fertility, if microbes are doing that, so soil oxygen, and the release of elements is directly tied to how much air and water is managed. You know, we talk about the perfect soil being 5% organic matter and, and you know, so many percents of minerals and so much percent air. Well, we don't get that oftentimes. So what kind of things can we do to augment the soil to try to help us get to that point? That's one reason why the number one thing, most guys, if they have the money that they can change a farm, first thing they do is what? They put in tile. Because if I put in tile, all kind of magic happens they weren't planning on what they, the farm looks like now that was 20 years ago when they put in the tile. All they were trying to do is get rid of the water. By getting rid of the water, dramatic changes in the way the farm started happening because of what? Air that allows organisms to grow. And if you start putting in new groups of organisms that aren't really new, they've just been selected out of the environment and reintroduced, all of this stuff little by little starts to make sense. And you start scratching your head and like, this all seems complicated, but it's not really when you start to think of it. The growth of roots because of soil temperature and tilt makes per perfect sense. The harder it is, the more compacted it is, the harder it is for roots to grow. Open it up, let it breathe, get a little warmer, bam, roots take off. Sustaining plant growth, soil oxygen for microbes and for roots to function and carbon dioxide release. We call that respiration. As I'm sitting here talking to you, I'm breathing in oxygen and I, breathe out carbon dioxide, and then we jump into the photosynthesis machine that we'll talk about a little later, and carbon dioxide in the air, plants pull it in and they grow more efficiently on higher sugars. And this is why we call carbon dioxide the greenhouse gas. The more carbon dioxide we have, the better the plants grow. And it turns it into a garden, if you will. So when we get into energy, water is needed for photosynthesis. And so we need a little water, but we don't want so much water that we turn the soil anoxic or anaerobic because plants have that unique ability to split water apart during photosynthesis. I mean, you know, when we talk about hydrogen bombs and fusion and fission and all this other stuff with the explosion of energy, funny how water is a source of it. So just splitting water and getting, and getting hydrogen and taking hydrogen, and splitting it apart, bam, a whole lot of energy stored up in just water. And water is used as photosynthesis for the enzymes to capture some energy bound in, in hydrogen bonds. Plants are supposed to build strong root systems before they emerge. That's, it's funny again, you know, we put a seed in the ground and we hope that the seed germinates and that roots get big and then it comes out. And so for those roots to get big, you have all kinds of things that have to happen. But plants are supposed to have bigger, better roots underneath them 
as they the right slightly before and as they come out of the ground because they have to sustain themselves once they start seeing sunlight they've got to have things that can exchange and work back and forth so i mean that's just common sense you can't have a little teeny tiny root and a great big plant on the top of it and expect good things to happen if you have small root systems they cover less surface area and the less surface area it covers the little amount of nutrition that it finds so if you get much larger root masses it's common sense all you got to do is increase the root mass. You don't have to change the soil test, just increase the root mass and you've improved the way that a plant finds its nutrient. If you have less surface area, the more net total available fertility is required to keep them functioning effectively with nutrient uptake. It's like I said, small roots, I better have a whole lot more nutrition laying around to find it. And sadly, many of the corn breeders in the last you know, 10 to 20 years have been breeding in smaller root masses because if I can conserve that energy in a smaller root mass, I can breed up the size of an ear. And so they've, they're beginning to find it's like, well, when you, when you put these out in fields, you need higher levels of potassium. You need higher levels of phosphate. Um, you need nitrogen in some cases closer to the, to the plant. It's just because the roots are smaller. And so they're not as efficient. If you have high level, very high levels of fertility, root masses typically don't grow as large. And therefore they're susceptible to drought strip. And we've seen this time and time again. I don't show people, it's like, look how much nutrients in this soil test. And you dig up the plants like, wow, the roots are kind of poor. Throw in biology and the roots grow even in that poor condition. And of course, if they're growing in that poor condition and, or they were in a poor condition, but now they're growing better and they're picking up more nutrients. It's like, look, there's a difference in the plant growth. I mean, how many times do we have to start checking off the boxes and seeing things before we start really thinking about what's going on? So if those varieties are bred for less root mass, and higher yield, and you have to accomplish this, and you have to spend more money to get it within reason, it still has to fit into the ROI. But if that's what we're growing for, that's more challenging. Now, I don't mean, mean to change the jobs of the breeders, corn breeders and soybean breeders, but if we actually bred plants to do better in lower fertility condition and put on more ears and figure out ways to sustain them better, that seems like a little more common sense issue. Beans that can branch and make them branch and branch profusely instead of single stems, it's just common sense. What's well, possible? Well, I actually got this, this picture from a colleague of mine, Jim Martindale from many, many, many years ago. And this goes back to Auburn back in the early seventies, you can see the National Tillage Lab at Auburn University. And I go back to the silly corn plant, even though we're talking about beans, but this is a, the, to prove the point. The point is this, seed was planted of corn in zero compacted soil. This plant yielded the equivalent over 400 bushel per acre with no applied plant food. Now, please do not hear that as an anti-fertilizer discussion. That's not what this is about. The main roots, when that seed was planted in that soil, went to the bottom of that six to, six, six to seven foot piece in less than 72 hours. When was the last time you saw a corn do that or a soybean plant do that? The clock is always running on root growth. Plants are supposed to set down their root system, go as far as they can in all directions, establish their area and take off. That's what they are supposed to do. And anything that allows that to be more efficient in the start is going to result in more potential net yield. So common sense and a little thought should kind of bring us to a logical conclusion. There should be a balance. There should be a balance between the added nutrients that we put in that we've spent money on and the available fertility that should be showing up on a soil test. There should be a balance between macronutrients, those that we spend most of our time and effort and money on and the micronutrients as a part of that same test. If we get macronutrients up here at a really high level and get them higher and higher and higher and we never change the micronutrients, the stave in the barrel idea begins to become a reality. We try to program them to do so much, but the limiting factor is way down here. If we pull out some of those macronutrients and we build up some of those micronutrients to get a closer balance, it's no surprise that things begin to get a little bit better. There should be a balance between soil and plant food and supplemental nutrients. Well, wait a minute. I thought fertilizer was food. That's my next point. What are you talking about? soil plant but i thought plants made their own food well they do but have you ever seen anything on this planet that's alive that doesn't eat no 
And if it eats, have you ever seen anything that doesn't get hungry? No. But we don't, we, we talk about plant food, we call ourselves the plant food industry, but we sell fertilizer. Fertilizer is nutrients, supplemental nutrients, not food. Have you ever woke up in the morning if you take uh, supplemental nutrients of any kind, unscrewed the, the, the bottle, you were hungry and your stomach was growling. Did you ever make the accident of actually taking the whole bottle thinking that your stomach would stop growling? No. So I thought, as I said in my last thought, I thought that's why we measure soil for fertilizer because we thought that was the, the food. No. You know, steak, mashed potatoes, green beans, nice piece of pie, a little bit of coffee, water, or nice soda. That's food. Okay. And plants are alive and soils with their biology are alive. And frankly, what we've started to see, this whole thing, when it comes right down to it, folks, there's a lot of things we're trying to figure out here, but it all comes down to eating. And the more we allow plants to eat, the more total extra nutrients they can consume. And when they can consume those nutrients and actually have more food, they make more plants. They make more fruitfulness. They're, they are more fruitful. We call it yield, but yield's what's all said and done when it's, ever, it's all finished. They make more bushel. The reality is soil testing. Soil testing was originally commissioned by the government back in the 40s, 30s, 40s, and 50s in an attempt to measure available fertility from mineralization in the soil. The soil is always breaking down, we understand that. And what was, what was the rate of them breaking down and how much available fertility could we find in the soil? Can we mimic the conditions? And the whole idea was we needed an effort to get rid of the post-war elements that were used in, in making munitions, potassium, phosphorus, nitrogens of all kinds. And rather than just go out and bury those in the ground and probably cause very bad degradation and pollution to occur, they said, can we actually figure out maybe what the levels are? And the only objective, as you see in here, was to discern whether there would be an economic response to those added elements if we could sell them to a farmer. It didn't create a system whereby they were trying to take advantage of it. They're just saying, look, if we can move these to the farm and they can get advantages from it, why shouldn't we? And of course, the fertilizer industry in some cases then was born. But that was the whole objective. So soil testing does not allow for total minerals in the soil that the elements are derived from. It's not a geological test. It's just a test to see what is the available portion in that soil. Now, the irony of it is, if the numbers were low, but we come from a really good biological development, the numbers would be low because microbes release nu nutrients in relationship to the plant asking for them. So if you go out and dig in the side ditch and in the, in, the, in the fence row and in the woods, the plants are growing fine. You very rarely see a tree that's not deep green with nitrogen. And its carrying load is about six to 10 pounds of actual nitrogen, six to 10 pounds of actual phosphate and a little higher level of potassium just because it's in a lot of the minerals around. But they're not off the scale. The other thing is if this begins to make sense a little bit with biology, soils that are tested under warm moist conditions are more accurately mimicking reality. If you come in the fall when it's been bone dry for two or three or four weeks and you just took off a nice 220 bushel corn crop or a, a 70 or 80 bushel bean crop, hasn't rained for weeks, or it begins to get really, really cold and the soil gets cold itself and the biology is not working much and it hasn't worked for weeks. By nature, what the soil test levels are gonna be, higher or lower, they're gonna be lower. It's the worst time in the year to actually test. And of course, in our minds, it's like, well, if we're trying to fix this thing up and make sure there's extra there, that's the lowest point it's gonna be, so let's load her up. But if at any point you would get nice warm conditions and you take a five gallon bucket of water and do it about five or 10 places and go take soil tests from them and then take soil tests in the dry areas, they don't look the same. If you'd have waited until March of next year and took them at that point, or even in June, they're going, oh, numbers are always gonna be different. So I get asked all the time, what's the best time? Well, the best time is understanding when you're gonna take them and what your objectives are. Um, but I rarely encourage people to go out and take soil samples that are coming on after a really big crop in a very long, hot, dry period, um, or if the soils have just turned and so suddenly frozen and got cold, I rarely tell them to expect those numbers to be realistic. And it's better to go out next spring and get a few more tests to confirm what you've actually got. Soil testing has only recently started allowing for biological testing. If that makes some sense, um, 
some of the new tests are actually giving us more indications of why things happen and more predictable reasons why they're happening. The other thing about this is there was no correlation to real yield res response ever established. Never, and there never will be. Because what you don't understand is there is no correlation to yield. There is no number on a soil test that correlates directly to a number associated with bushels at the end of the season. Because there are way too many other dynamics that go on in the soil system that, that change all that. So there's nothing consistent with bushels and soil fertility that exists even today due to variables. And if you think there is, you're seeing something that no one else ever sees. There are all kinds of charts and graphs that exist, but all kinds of unique things happen. Now, sure, I'm not standing, I'm not standing here saying research is in vain. You didn't hear that from me. Sure, there are charts to map the uptake and the needs of nutrients. We know that, and they are very accurate. The plant tells you what it's doing. You can follow the path. Sure, there are charts to map the uptake of water and nutrients in that solution that are going into the plants. We know that. And when the stuff's in the plants, it's common sense. If the solution's going in, or if, excuse me, if it's in the solution, if the solution's going in and nutrients are there, it's going into the plant. Exactly. Okay. And there are charts that describe with decent certainty that better yields many times seem to appear more often with higher levels of available fertility. Let's face it, if the plant doesn't find it, it's not gonna make yield. We understand that. But if you've ever seen those graphs, you understand that it's a scattering of all kinds of points of data. And what we do as scientists in statistics is we graph a line through all the middle of those points. And many of the points actually hit right on the line. And the more that hit right on the line, it gives us a higher level of confidence that it's kind of related. But when you see there's stuff all over the page, all of those pieces of data are still data. And what do they mean? And what about those that are the outliers that, you know, where there's very low fertility and clear over here in the corner, there's three or four or five that show some of the highest yields and some of the lowest fertility and vice versa. We want to believe that a certain element or two or three fixes our world, but it doesn't work that way. Now, it doesn't mean that it can't. But the way you do that is with balance. So we've talked a lot about the different stuff. Let's get down to the business of the soybean. That's what we're all about here. So soybeans are very tied to available fertility and nutrition and soil biology. If you don't believe that, pull them up and you see something on the roots called nodule, right? Nodulation is critical for soybeans to maximize bushels and it requires iron to establish on the root. If you have no available iron, when a nodule tries to get on your root, there is no nodule. And I would say 95 or 98 or 99% of you have never heard that in your entire life. If there's no iron available made by biology around that root, there is no nodule. It cannot start. Never. Also, soybeans are poor converters of sunlight compared to corn. And they need higher phosphate than has been widely reported. I've seen this for years because everybody was focused on potash. And I would see people who didn't get their phosphate levels up, or people who had been on long-term low input agriculture and they got the phosphate levels down into the single digits and their yields fell. And they're like, well, we've been doing liquid foliars or little bits of orthophosphate, body, body, body. And 40 bushels, 45 bushels in a good year was all they were getting. And I said, you're missing the phosphorus. Phosphorus is necessary to make energy in a plant and make it available. Go out and put on 150 pounds, 100 to 150 pounds of 1846, 1152, 046. You know, just like that, 20 bushels next year appears on, on the yield monitor. Because there's a huge amount of energy and beans aren't C4 plants like corns and grasses. They're very, very inefficient. So you got to help them be more efficient. And phosphate is one of the ways to do that. And I saw it for years and I said, one of these days, somebody will talk about it. And lo and behold, a couple, three years back, articles start coming out. It's like phosphorus seems to be more important. They need ample boron for sugar movement. Sugar flow into cells is controlled a little bit by boron. They need ample sulfur to make protein and they need it mid and late season. The new varieties need it mid and late season. We used to need it in kind of July and early August. Now we need it in mid to late August in September. Great university research done at, done at Purdue, Sean Castile. They need potassium in mid to late season to move waters and sugars. So they do need potassium and that's why when you start measuring 
um, soybean tissues, you start finding that they need potash. But there are some other interesting connections that are going that. We're going to talk about that a little later, but they do need potash. Okay. They need nitrogen at the end of the season to keep filling pods. We saw back into the 90s and early 2000s when we tried to start putting on urea and different nitrogens at later in the season and try to get them in there. And if we can be effective and we get it in there correctly without upsetting the apple cart, which is again was something we're going to talk about a little later, it works, but you got to know what you're doing. They need better upper roots and deeper root masses to be more efficient. One of the reasons why we have all these issues with soybeans in some cases is they don't develop root masses. They're very poor comparatively to some of the other, other crops. And whatever we can do to dramatically improve that root mass development has an impact on the bottom line. They need more food to accomplish all these things. And as new starters are coming out with soybeans today, you're finding out that they have far, far less NP and K and lots of other nutrients, maybe micro, micronutrients. They have things like sugar, humic acids, fulvic acids, microbes, things that actually help the root mass find more energy quicker and develop faster and get bigger and go deeper. And lo and behold, they yield better. With nodules on those roots and nodule packages like you see here, new seed treatments and things that kind of help these nodules improve, there's a very direct correlation between nodulation and soybean development. Well, again, another great CCA um, program that was just done at uh, up in Indianapolis or through Purdue University. But, but more and more data coming out as to actually what the bean need, needs. We, we've estimated and guesstimated for years. But it looks like beans need about 3.25 pounds per bushel to be able to make the bushel. And fixation, nitrogen fixation from nodulation is 75% of that. 75%. So they can find some nitrogen. We know that the beans are scavengers, that third point now. We know they're a good scavenger. But it depends on what they're finding. If they find certain nitrogens, thing, different things happen. So fixation from microbes in the soil is taking um, in, and taking in from the soil is, is all together part of the support. They use both, but they focus mostly on the nodules. And whatever makes the nodules more efficient, keeps them on there and functioning longer and doing a better job, makes for higher yield. So you don't expect to make a 100 bushel bean crop, as you see down here, with 325 bushels or, or pounds necessary. If you only have half of that, you only make half the bushel. It's a given. If you don't have enough boron to put all the seeds and program the plants, if you don't have enough branches and enough nodes and enough flowers, you don't make the yield. It's all connected as a big picture. Scavengers, late in the season for nitrogen, we've heard that for years. Sadly, though, when they scavenge and they dig down deep and they pull the water, what are they pulling in? Well, they're pulling in nitrates. Nitrates don't program for yield. Now, soybeans do have an enzyme called nitrate reductase, and they can actually convert some of that nitrate into amine forms. You see the name, that, that's the amine coming from like amino acids, nitrogen with a couple of hydrogen stuck on it. A lot of chemistry involved in this stuff, I realize. But when you hear some terms out here, it's like the more nitrate I throw to these plants, they grow vines and they get big and they're dark green and they're pretty. And then you pull them back and it's like, man, the nodes are six or eight inches apart and there's two or three pods hanging on the nodes. And, I just don't know what's wrong. So it seems like we ought to stress these things and make them short. And boy, when we do and we conserve the energy, wow. But well, what happens if we can make them big and then put pods and beans all over every node, cluster them all up with the things that we do? It's not so bad to have a tall plant if you can make it yield, but it's a program. And don't forget the molly because in a nodule without molybdenum in the nodule at a high enough rate, the nitrate reductase enzyme that's in there that's doing a lot of this work, making this nitrogen for you is not functioning well. That's why you're seeing more and more people talk about molly in part of their fertility programs or in part of seed treatments. Very, very tiny amount. Don't get carried away with molly. It's really hot. Or parts of the foliar programs. The magic of biology makes iron appear from nowhere, even though it's been there all the time. This is a picture from Iowa. A field on the right has been treated with, with live microbes uh, as a seed treatment or in the furrow or sprayed over the surface. The one on the left is what iron chlorosis appears all the time, a lack of iron. And when there is no iron, there is no what? No nodule. When there is no nodule, there is no nitrogen. When there is no nitrogen, there is no green color. When there is no green color, there is no yield. 
these particular farmers in some cases had soybean fields that had never yielded over 20 to 30, 28 to 30 bushels their entire life. And three generations of farmers, never. And the first year they started using these things instead of all the iron and different iron compounds and all the iron that they tried to get in the world, they put in biology. And for the very first time they, they turned green, they stayed green and they yielded 58 to 60 bushels in the very first year with a $10 investment. Now that's an increase of 30 bushels to the acre for 10. It's funny how some of these fields after they go in a little bit farther into the season into June or July, they'd start to green up. And of course they thought that meant something was changing in the soil where the, you know, the, the, either the roots had gotten deeper and they found what they needed. No, it was because the soil warmed up, the biology cranked up. There was biology out there to do the work, but there wasn't enough early in the season when things were a little bit too chilly but when they started putting the right microbes around the beans from the from day one, in some cases before they're even stretching their necks now, these beans are putting on nitrogen. The plant is a sugar machine and potassium and boron have some unique connections as a result. The plant needs water. We know that. Dry seasons kind of scare us to death, but it's funny how a dry season will scare you to death, but a wet season will starve you to death because the plant does need water to move some sugars around, but it doesn't want lots of water. Everything that gets lots of water in it, when sugar is what runs the plant, when you dilute the sugar, you decrease its efficiency. Try growing a watermelon in a wet year with all kinds of rain. Biggest watermelons you've ever seen with no flavor in it because all the sugars are diluted. So a wet year will starve you to death. It's there and you can eat it, but it doesn't taste good and you just don't want it. A wet year will starve you to death because it dilutes the sugar. So there's an inverse correlation that exists between potassium and boron levels in my experience in the plant, and it's been well documented. If boron causes sugar production and flow to move into cells, the plant's a sugar machine. So it needs far, far less water to complete its cycles. It just needs a little water enough to move some things around. Well, potash is what's controlling water flow in the plant. It doesn't really structure up much in the different things in the plant. It just sits there on different sides of cell walls and membranes and causes water to flow and move. So we've used potash for years to try to flow more and more water through to get more stuff to come in from the soil and flush it around through the plant. But as a result of doing that, we dilute the sugars. Most of us have never applied a pound of boron in our lives. If we go back to putting boron in the system and get the boron levels up in the tissue, we don't need as much potassium to grow the crop. And boron per acre is far, far, far less costly than potash is. So it's not throwing away the potash, it's not throwing away the baby with the bathwater. You need some potash, but you don't need nearly the potash that you have if you get good, good, good boron levels in here. Okay, so boron is necessary for the max seed number and the sugar movement, and there is no substitute for boron of any other element in reactions in the plant. In many cases, many reactions that can be run, some elements can kind of substitute in if it's missing, like an iron or a magnesium molecule for calcium or something. But in the case of boron, there is no substitute. So if you're out of boron, you're out. So plant growth considerations. Beans need help with energy conversions. Anything tied to energy in plants is often goes right back to phosphorus because in the, the, the massive amount of chemistry and biochemistry, there's a chemical called adenosine diphosphate, ADP. And when you excite this, just like a battery and you recharge this battery, the ADP becomes ATP and it stores energy. And then all these systems that need energy, they go to the ATP and they pull that phosphorus out and they get the energy and it goes back to an uncharged battery as ADP. And this thing just sets there in cycles. I mean, the chemistry is absolutely fantastic. If you don't believe there's a creation, all you gotta do is look at this whole thing of energy conversion and photosynthesis, fascinating. Soils with less than 10 parts per million of phosphorus and poor, um, Conditions of balance with micronutrients typically are, are a major lose of the loss of about 20 bushels to the acre. It's funny, even if you get low phosphate, but you have a good balance of micronutrients with all that, you don't get the major losses. But man, if you're at 10 parts per million and your, and your micronutrients are in the toilet, your yields are, are terrible. You gotta be careful though. You wanna fix that. But if you put out too much phosphorus in the soil, you can mess up the availability of other nutrients, especially the metals. Phosphorus has a nice big three minus charge. So if you think of the battery, it's got three minuses. It's very, very strong. It's got three minuses. Copper, zinc, manganese, iron, those are all metals. They have a very, they have a two plus charge. So they have a very strong charge. So just like a magnet or a battery, the two opposite ends attract each other. 
two phosphorus molecules would give you six minus charges. Three zinc molecules would give you six positive charges. So two phosphoruses can tie up three zincs. And the more phosphorus you throw to the soil, those of you guys who've been in manure, you've known this for years. I get so much phosphorus in the soil, things kind of go wacko. They yield well for a while and then all of a sudden it falls apart. Too much phosphorus ties up your micronutrient nutrition. So now you got to supplement micronutrient nutrition because you overloaded the soil with too much phosphorus. So there's a delicate balance that has to be achieved in there. And don't, don't get too scared because a lot of that stuff we can fix with chelation that we're going to talk about here in the, in the, in the next piece. So it sets the stage for utilizing, in some cases, foliar feeding or, or banding of fertility in a changed form that allows us to get there. And what we're going to focus in on when we start talking about this next piece is the photosynthesis makes the sugars and supplies the energy. And here you have the reaction down below in the yellow orange box. Six waters and six carbon dioxides in the presence of sunlight energy in a plant with some chlorophyll yields glucose sugar and releases some oxygen so that we can survive. So microbes supply the minerals that make the photosynthesis machine function inside the plant once the structure is put together. And that's the big picture. So that's just kind of the end of the, the first session that we're starting here, the summary um, for uh, soils providing nutrition. Soils feed plants and plants are designed to feed soils. Remember that. If you remember that, you're on your way to begin to figure out what's going on here. Soil, air, water is far, far more important than we realize. So anything that helps us chemically or physically, which is why we've been having our love affair for how many decades with iron and steel. If we get air in the soil, it kind of helps us. But if we get too much air for too long, we actually burn up the organic matter because the microbes chew it all up. Soil microbes rule. And there's a delicate balance to sustaining good, changing, diverse microbial activity. And when we feed that soil, we can watch the change. Why is it so many of you have gone over to litter or manure and said, you know, there's something different about that and we don't understand it. Well, we value the manure based on the nutrients, but the main value in the manure is the manure itself. It's the carbon that's in the rest of the leftover stuff from the undigested food that is actually food for the microbes and stimulates them. And they can cause a net release of phosphorus over many, many, many years. And so we've always seen where we put on phosphor or put on manure, our phosphorus levels go up and they seem to last so long, much, much different than dry fertilizer. Because when dry fertilizer melts, it flows into the system, it locks up on so many other elements and it stays there for decades and we don't see it anymore. It's not gone, we just don't see it. And in that realm, soil testing is only measuring the available stuff, the available phosphorus, if you will. If it's locked up and tied onto um, copper, zinc, manganese, and iron, and it's not showing up on the chart, it doesn't mean it ever left the system. It's still there. It's just got to figure out how to break it back apart. Well, that's the job of microbes, and they possess the enzymes to do that. So uh, there's a portion of the total soil potential in the elements that are there, but that's what soil testing is measuring in, in the greatest percentage right now. Okay. Jeff, I see you popped up there. Have we got any questions? uh yes we did have in the chat here um the question is how many pounds of nitrogen can a bean make for itself i don't know that we actually have begun to figure that out yet um because it's a matter of how many total pounds per acre but we know uh we've seen um we've seen yield levels achieved by the guys that are out here growing soybeans uh, and they've gone as high as what 170 I think I think even Randy when he did his test years ago when he got into the 170s had some beans that went 220 and 250. Well if 75 percent of the nitrogen comes from fixation how much can each bean make that's all relative to how much how, how well it's operating it's is it got the other nutrients to do it obviously you know a bean itself can make many 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 pounds of, of nitrogen uh, we all, in the recent research that was done in the same realm, it takes six pounds of total sugars or carbon to make a pound of nitrogen. So, I mean, I don't know what that number is. Does it make a difference? Yes. Um, but beans are much more capable if you get nodules on, underneath them. We, we focused in the nodules on the main stem. We always said those were the most efficient. 
But if you saw some of those pictures I showed you all ago, there's nodules everywhere on the plant. Does that make them more efficient? Not necessarily, but it adds to the whole big picture of what's going on and all that nitrogen, no matter how efficient or inefficient coming from way out here on the roots is headed for one direction. And that's the main stem to feed those pods. So it's the, the secret is, and, and we've all known that, that's why we're trying to make more nodules on the plant. The more nodules we put on that bean root, the more nitrogen it makes. Okay, um, so you're wanting to take just a few minute, four or five minute bio break here, or that's, do you want to go into the next session? That's up to you. I mean, I can I can take uh, I can take four four or five minutes. What time is it? Are you are you done at the hour like th three hours, or is this gonna does this go on in, indefinitely? Uh, that'd be a Becky question. <laughs> Um, I tell you what, let's uh, let's let's see. We are quarter till. What time did we start? About uh, eight thirty. Did start at eight thirty? Okay, so yeah, we're running a little ahead. If we want to keep on going, we can for this round, and then if we want to get to the end of that, okay. One, why don't break. why don't we do why don't we right. do that? Uh, we'll jump Fine. into uh, to your second part here, and then okay. we'll take a short break at the conclusion the of that. Okay, great. All right, so this is uh, part two of the, this, uh, the, the three ones we're going after. This is soybean nutrition and uh, how plants are influenced by foliar feeding. And there's a lot of, uh, again, misunderstanding and things that we may think to be true and, and untruth in foliar feeding. And so this is uh, based on what I've been doing now for about 20 to 25 years of, of uh, actual foliar feeding with people around the country on all kinds of different crops. Um, and in some cases, really in the last 15 years on soybeans, because we've done it for longer than that, but really a lot of products are coming to bear in the market to, to, um, to allow us to do some of these things. And I get this question a lot, does foliar feeding even work? Because I mean, I've had people calling from, in some cases, the deep south down here saying, look, the, the university personnel are telling us we're wasting our time, phosphorus can't even get into a plant through foliar feeding. Um, have all kinds of different things. And in many cases down here in the south, uh, south and southeast, when they put foliar feed, they put like a, let's say a 10 O10, no phosphorus in it because they've been told phosphorus can't get into the plant. Well, if you're using the wrong form of phosphorus and not doing it properly, they're right. But once you understand that things can be augmented to, to change that and allow things to happen for you, it makes a huge difference because that phosphorus represents energy. And if you spray it right on the leaf, it will change the scenario. So many advisors still do not believe in foliar feeding. And as a result, discourage growers from even starting because again, with a lack of information and the whole idea about return on investment, very rarely do they see some things happen depending on what they're using in that scenario. Or they may believe it works, but disagree that it works on soybeans. For some reason, it's like whatever we're using, it's not working in a soybean. And that's mostly the case, especially if there's been an imbalance in the nutrition that's been put into that plant. And just because you throw an NP or a K on there, if that's all you're using, it isn't going to work because there's not enough things to support the whole idea that even if it went in, it's gonna make a change and make a difference. The other thing that makes foliar feeding a little bit strange for people is how can such small quantities of product do anything at all to influence growth? When we know that boron can be toxic and if we put too much boron on, we're scared to death because like, be careful who you're talking to or what you're doing because you can burn the plant to the ground and kill it. Well, there's some truth in that. So obviously you don't use lots and lots of boron. But if you put out you know, a few ounces to a pint or a quart of, of a low percentage boron and you put a little bit of molly with it, less than an ounce per acre, and that's all you did in some cases, man, for the first time you see something happen and you don't understand what it is. You do it enough and the plant stays short. You do it enough and more flowers appear. You do it enough and flowers turn into pods. And when the pods hang and they fill, that's bushel. How can those small quantities hope to even possibly compete with the large quantities of soil fly products we put on? Come on now. I mean, I, I hear that all the time. How can you go out here and put on a pound of sugar, expect it to do this? How can you put on a quart of micronutrients and expect it to do this? I mean, let's face it, you know, there, there's hundreds of pounds or thousands of pounds of stuff out here. How can they possibly compete? Well, let's, let's explore that. Well, how about time? I mean, a lot of people throw on fertilizer right before you, you plant the spring. Soil applied nutrients may need time to dissolve and get moving if indeed they do move freely with water. 
such as nitrogen and potash. They do move freely with water as water flows into the plant, the plant can selectively pull them out and use them. But phosphorus, not so much. Phosphorus, the plant has to go to. It works through diffusion. It, it, it breaks apart a little and moves a very little bit. So the roots have to typically find all the phosphorus that they get, or they have to have microbes right around all the little thousands and billions of hair roots on their plant that releases the phosphate right near the root and have to suck it up. So time is not in your favor if you're trying to put on dry fertilizer and you're using lots of phosphorus, it's not in your favor at all. That phosphorus is gonna tie up and very, very small percentage is ever gonna get in the plant. If the nutrient is something soil life wants, if, if there are microbes in the soil that are alive and they need nitrogen in some form or fashion, for instance, and they can grab some of your nitrogen, they're gonna take it and they're gonna turn it into the things they need. So the soil always takes a little piece of some of the stuff that we put out there. The soil solution creates nutrient dilution. The solution to pollution is dilution. We hear that all the time. But when, when the product actually dissolves and get into the soil solution, it develops parts per million. And the more water that's there, the lower the dilution gets. So if we think about spreading granules hither, hither and yon all over the place, if we put out 200 pounds to the acre of something, and one part, per, one part per million is two pounds per acre. So if we put out 200 pounds per acre, we'd have, let's say, 100 parts per million. But if we put that into a band next to a row, that will actually increase that by you know, three to six times. If we put it in a smaller band right in the furrow, that might do 12 to 15 times. So what we had out here was 100 parts per million everywhere or 1,500 parts per million right on the seed. And when we put it on the foliage, it's the same type of thing. The parts per million, the concentration goes way, way up. So putting things on a leaf is estimated at six to time, 10 times greater in efficiency. So that's, you know, three pounds of, of foliar, so three pounds of nitrogen or something in a foliar or a phosphate will be the equivalent of 18 to 30 applied in a single application in the soil, just based on increased concentrations. So it allows us to think about what a plant might need and when it might need it and time it around that. Because see, the plant doesn't care how it finds its fertility as long as it finds it in time. Too late is too late. Too early might be too early, but just in time, which is what foliar feeding in some cases allows us to do, makes all the difference in the world. Products must be formulated to protect them from chemistry interactions. When I ask people, how many of you ever had a chemistry course, even if it was back in high school, we're surprised at the number of people who haven't had a chemistry course because it wasn't either part of a curriculum back when, in the day. It's not something that every cat's interested in, right? I mean, it can be one of the most boring things in the world. There are some people that are you know, totally excited by chemistry. I enjoy it. A lot of people don't even understand chemistry. And chemistry, sadly, they've said is up to 80 to 90% of the business of agriculture. If you've had a chemistry course, and you remember it, I'm, most of you have forgotten everything you learned in chemistry because it wasn't practical, but you know, you mixed chemicals in a test tube or a beaker and you kind of watched them. And sometimes they turn wonderful, neat colors and good reactions happen. Sometimes bad reactions happen. On the farm, this is one of the most common ones. You see the upper box there. If you've ever poured calcium into a phosphate solution and made calcium phosphate, we call it cottage cheese. It really is, is, is an element or a mineral called appetite. This, if you hear that, teeth and bones is appetite. Now, does that sound very soluble to you? And when you see the cottage cheese farm, if you've ever done that in a tank, whether it's a, a fertilizer tank on a tractor or a sprayer tank on a sprayer, fear of God comes on you. You know you got work to do because you got to clean this whole mess out. But what's interesting about this is you can actually take calcium that's in this mix and employ the idea of what we call chelation. You'll see it, somebody call it some people call it chelates, but it's, it's actually pronounced chelate. That's the Greek term for the claw. And we're talking about like the claw on a lobster or a crab, okay? Chelation means to, to grab and claw or, or engulf. And so on the right there, you see basically a, uh, a, a chemical compound that's an organic compound that's been created out of an element, a bunch of elements. And it basically creates a claw. And you see the claw that the M in the middle would stand for basically the, the element like calcium or, 
or iron or manganese or, or copper or zinc. And you can actually take the claw, put in the element that you want to protect and the claw will wrap around it. And it keeps those elements from interacting. So in this case, calcium's inside my claw. I pour phosphate all over it, but the phosphate can't get to the calcium. So when you do that, the one down below would be what calcium and phosphate, where calcium has been chelated, you pour them together into the tank and lo and behold, there's, there's no bad news. Then when the chelate gets inside the plant, the plant understands the chelation and provides a specific element, in this case, many times it's hydrogen or a proton or just a little hydrogen in from water and plop, it pops it open when it gives it that hydrogen and out comes the calcium and the plant uses the calcium where it needs it. So chelation is a magic chemistry term that we use to make sure that cottage cheese doesn't form. Now cottage cheese is only one visible form. Many other things can happen. So for instance, when you take glyphosate, glyphosate in and of itself is a chelate, just like the thing on the right side of the box. And when glyphosate gets inside plants, when glyphosate gets inside microbes, when glyphosate gets inside animals, it actually goes in as the claw open with nothing in it. And it's trying to find elements to claw onto. Then when you used glyphosate many years ago on your soybeans and they turned bright yellow, we always called that Roundup Flash. And what Roundup Flash was, was when there was enough uh, glyphosate inside the tissue, the claw is floating around as glyphosate and it found manganese, that was what it was most preferred metal was, and it wrapped it up. And so for eight days, the chelate would sit there locked up onto that manganese. And it took about eight days for that thing to degrade and fall apart and begin to release the manganese. So if you did tissue analysis, you could even find yellow plants that said the manganese levels are fine. Well, that was because the manganese didn't leave the plant. It was locked up by an organic compound. And when you do tissue analysis, you burn or fire up the tissue and you burn away all the carbon to release the ash. And when you burned away the glyphosate chelate, you're set the manganese. So it would even tell you that even though you had a manganese deficiency, the tissue analysis said it was okay. It just wasn't right. So chelation can help you fix products and make products available to a plant that where other solutions that you mixed up before, like if you mixed up manganese sulfate and zinc sulfate in with glyphosate, most of your manganese and zinc never ever got to the plant because as the glyphosate was in there and the manganese sulfate went off into manganese and sulfur, the manganese, when it's sitting out here, ran into a, ran, ran into a glyphosate molecule and bam, locked it up, locked it up for a long, long time. And never, your plant never saw it for many, 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 many days. It never fixed the problem. So you could use it, it didn't work. The sulfur would help the plant turn green because it wasn't locked up, but you never got the manganese into the tissue. Products must be formulated properly to cross, cross the waxy cuticle barrier that we have on the surface of the leaf. That wax is there to protect from things moving out. And in some cases from things moving in, it, it helps keep the plant tissue moist, okay? But that wax creates an entirely different chemistry. Just because something dissolves or is suspended in a water solution that we're gonna spray on the surface of the plant does not mean it's gonna go across the cuticle for two reasons. One is maybe it's not built to do that. The other is with that waxy cuticle on the surface, water by its nature, as a general rule, unless it's actually changed a little bit, does this. You see that surface of the leaf and the water beads on the wax surface because water does not react with organic stuff as a general rule, especially wax. Candle or water on a wax candle just rolls off, doesn't do anything. Okay? Salts, in a sense, that are dissolved in water repel on the surface of the leaf because of the water and the dissolving of the salts. When was the last time, think about this now, when was the last time you think plants saw most of the fertilizer that they obtain as salts falling from the sky and landing on their leaves? They're not built specifically to take in salted fertilizer from the sky. They're built to take in some salted fertilizer from the roots, but not through their leaves. Why does 28% or 1034 burn soybean leaves so badly? Because it sits on the surface with the water and rolls to the edges. If it stays in one spot and it's concentrated 
urea nitrogen or ammonium nitrogen or nitrate nitrogen, it's so super concentrated that it burns where it sits. Or if it falls to the edge of the leaf, the whole outside of what we call the leaf margin or the leaf edge, it burns it to a crisp because there's no way to get the nitrogen in and it sits there and, and it focuses the water and the light and the salt right in one spot, bam, it just kills tissue. Can you fix that? Can you fix that and change the results? If so, how do you do that? Well, the answer is yes, you can change that. In the world of chemistry, we call it like dissolves like. Salts play with water and salts. Organic molecules with carbon chains around it, like you think about sucrose sugar, any sugar. Carbon-based things interact and dissolve with carbon-based things. So they're separate worlds. So if you consider grease, engine grease on your hands, Jim Ulrichs, who was one of the professors I got my master's under, I saw him teach this masterfully for years. And I always, the picture got my mind and I couldn't get it out. But if you have engine grease, if you've been working on a motor and you get engine grease all over your hands, I mean, the black murky stuff. And, you know, it's right around noon and somebody calls us, hey, it's lunchtime, get your hands cleaned up, get in here and it's time to have lunch. So you run over and you have this grease on your hands. And so you throw a little soap on it and you wash your hands. And all it did is kind of make it doesn't even hardly make it slimy, doesn't hardly move. The soap won't cut it. You know, soap just won't do it. He said, if you're smart, what you'll do is you'll grab something like light engine oil, like three and one oil. And you take a drop or two of three and one oil and you put it on that engine grease and you rub it around. And man, all of a sudden that engine grease, it just, it just cuts it. Because like dissolves like, organic things just like themselves. And so then you take a little soap, which is way, way less total carbon, and you put a little soap with it and you wash your hands, and it goes away. But the soap being just little teeny tiny carbon loads and lots of salt, it doesn't do anything. What do you use to make pesticides work better if you know what you're doing on the leaf? You put in what? It's the surfer, surfactant. You see it on the right here, water plus surfactant. Plain water beads up, but if you put surfactant, which is what? Carbon-based, and if it's done correctly, carbon-based with a little salt on the end of it, the surfactant spreads out the surface on leaf because it'll actually attract itself to all that waxy cuticle and it spreads out. And lo and behold, if it's done right, it moves products right into the plant. What kind of things are carbon-based, inexpensive, and readily recognized by the plant? The number one is if you go back to that photosynthesis picture, number one is glucose sugar. That's what it makes and it recognizes it. When it recognizes it on the surface, it sends its minions and says, go get that. Well, sucrose is what we get when we have sugar in tea, sugar on the table, that's sucrose sugar. Sucrose is a marriage of glucose and fructose. Fructose, we've heard is high fructose corn syrup. Where do we get high fructose corn syrup from? Corn seeds. The seed, the sugar that makes seeds and reproduces is fructose. So sucrose is the marriage of glucose, the photosynthesis sugar, with, sucra, or with fructose, the reproductive sugar. You put it on a plant, the plant recognizes it. It has all the enzymes to tear it apart, has all the enzymes to put it back together if it wants to, it recognizes it. So energy in the form of sugars are what plants love. And when you put sugars on the surface of a leaf, they'll actually go to get that sugar. They can move themselves and pull that through the, through the, um, through the cuticle and bring in that sugar. And if something is small enough to go through that cuticle attached to that sugar, it's coming in the plant at a very rapid rate. The physiologist will tell you in a matter of milliseconds, if sugar appears on the leaf of a plant, that the plant sends its minions out to actually begin to collect that sugar and bring it into the plant. What is it that plants are hungry for? Well, if they make sugar, they're hungry for sugar. It's just common sense. If they know what to do with sugar from the minute they're born, they can do anything and everything they want to with sugar. They can take the very basic carbon chains, tear them apart, and then rebuild them back into other carbon things that they need throughout their entirety of their plant. So that's why I say, is there a difference between nutrients and food? If we bring in the food and we raise the energy levels of the plant, the plant's in high gear and doing all kinds of other things. And as it gets bigger and bigger, then it needs a few more nutrients to get things done. But without the food, if we just put nutrients in there and all the needs are being met currently, it's not doing anything. You got to get a plant to grow to help it pull in nutrients. When I talked with David Hula last year about some of the high yields that he attained, I said, you obviously are putting in more food because you've been trying to throw nutrients through the system for years 
that are getting you incremental gains. But when you popped 80 bushels above the world record in one year's time, you threw the food to it, didn't you? And when I talked to him, certainly he did. He confirmed that those, all those issues. I said, you finally gave the plant and the soil enough food to utilize the nutrients you've been trying to jam down its throat for years. If you put sugars in with nitrogen in the right balance, in, with, in, in the right balance, no burn occurs. If you, if you wanted to spray a gallon or two of 28% over soybeans, if you just went out and put on a gallon or two of, of straight 28%, It'll burn 11 dickens out of the soybeans. But for each pound or each gallon of nitrogen that you want to use, you put in a pound of sugar up to about three pounds. So you can maybe make about three or four or five gallons of, of 28% without burning that plant. And I don't recommend it. I'm just saying if you actually did that and you're worried about burn, if you put a pound of sugar per gallon of 28 or 10340, or in some cases, even a little bit of bisulfate, it won't burn. But be very, very careful. And I would not be spraying that in the middle of the afternoon because when light hits those molecules, it's going to intensify the sunlight and you're going to get some burn. But it can be done. But I'd suggest unless you know what you're doing, you better not play that way. Be careful with your nitrogen source when you apply things in a foliar scenario. Hmm. Well, I thought nitrogen was nitrogen. I hear this all the time, just like I hear lime is lime. That's what the university's told me for years, lime is lime. No, 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 that's not true. Why do we spend all this time in chemistry labs trying to see all the differences between all these different things? And then one day when we get professional degrees, we walk out and we say, ah, don't worry about that. Nitrogen is nitrogen, lime is lime. Well, that must've been a waste. Either I learned the wrong stuff in the chemistry lab or somebody didn't get the right information through the chemistry lab into their head. And I've dealt with this for years. You got to realize nitrates, NO3 minus, nitrates are nitrates and nitrates program plants to grow. I learned this from Don Huber, one of the most brilliant physiologists I've ever met, plant physiologist. And he taught me things and you're learning from it today. I mean, if it hadn't been for Don Huber, you wouldn't be learning any of the things that you're learning today because he's the one who taught me to think outside the box. And when you get too many nitrates in a plant, that's what makes vines grow. That's what makes anything grow. Nitrate, when it gets into a plant, tells the plant, if it stays as nitrate, I need you to grow. It can come in through the roots, it's going to the tops, but once it gets into the tops, it stimulates growth. So if you want vines or big, pretty plants, you give it nitrates, okay? When you think about the amounts of water that go into soil systems and plant systems, we all know that nitrogen oftentimes as it builds into the soil system is not stable. We use stabilizers to keep it from, from getting converted. What do we try to keep it to getting converted to? Nitrates, because nitrates leach. They have a, a ne negative charge and so does the soil. So they repel each other. So nitrates sitting in the soil will leach away. That's God's way of taking the creation and saying when there's too much nitrogen, it's dangerous. It'll kill plants. It'll kill microbes. Let's wash it away. And so what we do is we go in there with stabilizers to do what? Kill certain microbes that cause this thing to happen. And we get soil test levels that are too high in nitrogen, in some cases, for too long. But when we get soils in the middle of summer, for instance, if you're an irrigated soybean grower and you constantly turn the water on because you don't want to stress the plant and you don't want them not getting enough nutrient, you keep the water going all the time. And as the soil gets moist, the microbes kick in. They change the nitrogen that was in the urea form or the ammonium form. Uh, the nitrate's already nitrate, but they change it over into nitrate form to leach it away. Well, it doesn't get away from the roots in some cases because the, the roots are sucking up the water. And as they're sucking up the water, they're sucking in the nitrate. And as they're sucking in the nitrate, those irrigated beans are so pretty. And they start growing so tall and they'll get up here and they'll be scratching your armpits. And then you go to harvest them and you're so excited. And you know, you got dry land beans that yielded 62 bushels and you got irrigated beans that yielded 65. And you're like, I just spent all this time and money and effort for three bushels. I don't get it. That's right, because you need to allow time, just a little bit of moistening, and then allow time for that soil to kind of dry up and keep the nitrogen that the microbes make as an amine form to go into that plant, because amine or ammonium forms program the plant to reproduce. So the more nitrates you make, the more pretty vines you've got. And trust me, I don't think any of us in soybean production in the United States are into vine production. We didn't grow it. If you were in the the 30s when they first started 20s and 30s 
but you are making the forage for animals, now that's a different story. But you still want more pods to give you more protein. So you got to think about some of these things that we're doing. So if I'm going to foliar feed and I put lots of nitrates in my foliar feed, I'm going to get growth and I'm going to feel satisfied when I put it on there that the color changed and the thing started to grow. But I'm not after vine growth. I'm after flowers and pods. So ammonium forms or amine forms of nitrogen um, or even urea forms when they go in as foliar. Urea forms as a foliar form is an ammonium form. But urea that hits the soil that sets her in a moist condition for 72 hours has already been converted to nitrate in many cases, okay? So these are the reproductive forms and they move all over the plant. Once the plant gets an amine form, it can take it anywhere. In the tops, up to the pods, reproduction, you can even throw it back down to the roots and make more roots grow. But nitrate, once it comes in, only stays up at the top and causes growth. This was an interesting study that was done back in 1996 at Penn State. Dr. Heckman, and I've been reporting on this for years because I've used this all over the country to help fix problems that people couldn't, they couldn't think their way out of because they, they didn't understand what's going on. When you feed a plant nitrate nitrogen and the plant pulls it in, plants have to grow in an electrically neutral state. They can't become supercharged because if they do, it's like, you know, when you're got the little puppy dog running around on the carpet in the middle of winter and you reach down to pet him and bam you know you get that electrical shock from static electricity if plants did not grow in an electrical balance every time you went in there it'd be, click, 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 it'd be everywhere okay they have to they have to grow in an electric charged state little by little not all not con constantly but most of the time so when a plant brings in a nitrate element a nitrate compound it has to kick out into the soil system something that keeps it balanced. So it's gonna bring in negative charge as a nitrate's in O3 minus. It needs to kick out something that is negatively charged. What does it kick out? It kicks out bicarbonate. Now, if you know anything about chemistry and you've heard of bicarbonate of soda, you've got acids, which are vinegars, bicarbonates, which are soda. So bicarbonates are alkaline. They're above pH 7. So what Dr. Heckman found is as they had nitrates, whether it was from urea that converted or just nitrates in the soil system or nitrates even in a foliar scenario, when they put nitrates on, they actually grew the roots out and they grew them with the pH color indicator. And the color that you see under the nitrate is now basically alkaline. It's pH between eight and a half and nine and a half all around the roots. Hmm, okay, so what's the problem with that? Well, when I raise that pH up into that range and there's no acid, because acid is a hydrogen ion, you know, when you see ammonia tanks, it's NH3. So hydrogen is acid. And so when the plant sees the nitrogen as an ammonium form, if it pulls the nitrogen away, it's got acids left. That's why anhydrous ammonia acidifies your soil. Here, the pH is way too high. There's no acid around. So the copper, the zinc, the manganese, the iron, and in many cases, the phosphate lock up and are completely tied up and don't do anything. And where did you lock them up? <laughs> right around the very roots that you wanted to absorb them. So when I go out west and the pH in the soil is already eight, eight and a half or nine, and I see people using lots of urea or lots of 28% of, uh, that's not stabilized, they, they're like, oh, the fertilizer is no good anymore. We get a little greening out of it for a few days and then all of a sudden the color's gone and the, the fertilizer just doesn't seem to last. <laughs> I said, well, why don't you use some ammonium sulfate? Oh, we'd never do that. That's the most expensive form of nitrogen we can buy. We're not gonna use that. I'm like, no, 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 no. You're only buying nitrogen in your mind. You're buying nitrogen and you're buying sulfate and you're buying copper and you're buying zinc and you're buying manganese and you're buying iron and you're buying phosphate and you're buying all kinds of other things because when that plant takes in ammonium nitrogen, as you see on the right, ammonium is, is, is NH4 with a positive charge on it. So four hydrogens around the nitrogen. And when it pulls in that positive charge, the thing that it kicks out of the roots to keep it growing electrically balanced is a hydrogen ion, a proton, they call it a hydrogen ion, and a hydrogen ion is acid. And you see the term pH, the, 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 you got a little P and a big H, and people are always like, this is backwards. Why is the H not capitalizing the P? The H stands for hydrogen. You're measuring acid. 
and the hydrogen scale is zero to 14 with seven in the middle, the pH scale, okay? Zero is, is all acid, 14 is all alkaline. And in the middle, there's a balance between the two. Very low amounts of acid are actually present in, at pH seven. And as you go above pH seven, it gets, it gets lower and lower and lower in a, in a logarithmic form. So what happens is in Dr. Heckman's study where the pH indicator is that you see all the yellow roots, that means the pH around the yellow roots is 4.5. The acid concentration is huge. Now it's only high really around the root, but that's wonderful because now around the root where the acid comes out, what happens to the copper, the zinc, the iron, the manganese and the phosphorus? It melts and it becomes available. So I said, when you use ammonium sulfate, it's funny how the plant greens up and it stays green for weeks. You were buying expensive nitrogen. I thought that's all you got. You got sulfur, makes sulfuric acid. You got hydrogen that makes acid from the plants inside and out. And if you use this stuff over here on the right, on the left side, that's, that's all urea or all nitrate. Lo and behold, pH goes higher yet. You lock up all your nutrition, plant can't grow worth a hoot. No sugars. Plenty of top growth, no reproduction. They stop thinking, they're like, I never heard this before. That's right. So now when you make a foliar product, if you put lots of nitrates in your foliar, this happens as well as growing tops, but no re reproduction. When you use ammonium or amine forms, just like that, the world of the plant changes because you programmed it to do something different. And when you get an acidic rhizosphere, as it says below, and many times as the rhizosphere right around the roots is acid, you'll get a, a suppression of many of the, of the diseases that attack roots. So careful of your timing when you want to apply. Do you know what your plant is doing when you begin to try to fool your feed it? If it's very small and it's not reproducing yet, your objective is either to kind of get it to grow a little bit and put leaves on or bigger leaves or put roots on, okay? Are you interested in growth or reproduction? If you're in reproduction or right before reproduction, what do you want your plant to do? Because you can tell it in a sense what to do with foliar feeding. If it's in reproduction mode, it's a huge demand for energy for plants to switch over from just growing foliage to start reproducing. So if there's an energy call, the things that focus on energy are huge, phosphorus, boron, and sugars in and of themselves. And the more you put to it, and the more extra it has, the more it gifts you with more reproduction. So if reproduction requires a lot of energy, have you provided more energy to help it do its job better? If you haven't, doesn't mean that you're gonna be a failure. It just means that if you can buy energy for, in some cases, think about it, 60 cents a pound, 30 to 60 cents a pound. If I can start buying energy for inexpensive relative to nutrients, and I put the plant energy on here, some magic things happen now. It's a little different. I'm gonna cover something here in a minute that, that you haven't thought about, or maybe you have thought about, but that's keeping you from doing it. That's how can so little sugar make anything happen. Is the energy coming from sugars or organic acids like humic acid or fulvic acid or um, vinegar, which is acetic acid, which is an organic acid or phosphorus? Because if you get the phosphorus in the plant and it absorbs it into the plant and it makes more ATP, more energy is stored and the plant can work for a lot longer on, on good efficiency or both. You can put both in there. And phosphorus needs to go in as the orthophosphate form. So the, those of you guys who've been using the the 318 18s and the 918 9s and the 624 6s with high orthophosphate contents or 100% orthophosphate, those are the forms that really need to go into the plant. The poly chains that you get as the majority out of 10340 just sits on the leaf and it doesn't do anything. Just like it sits in the soil and doesn't do anything because the chains have them locked up and they're not, they're not available to the plant. If you want to prove to yourself that something can happen on a foliar treatment, spray some of these orthophosphate products or take one or two pounds of sugar or both and put them together in a water solution, you know, five to 10 gallons to the acre. You don't need 10 gallons to the acre. Sometimes if all you're doing is foliar feeding, now if you got a pesticide in there that needs distribution, that's different. But you can put on three or four or five gallons of water for the foliar treatment and actually just get spread across the leaf. And if it's done right, made right, it'll absorb right in. So just a matter of getting it on the plant. But spray them on the plant today, go out tomorrow and pull up a few plants or dig them up, better off is dig them up with, with a shovel, take the soil away from the roots and magically what you're gonna find is brand new roots. 
On the ones that are untreated, you dig them up and there's no new roots. So if there's new roots where you foliar fed, but no new roots where you didn't, the energy levels in the plant above were high. And the plant says, what am I going to do with extra energy? Well, if it's not in the reproduction phase and it's nowhere for it to go, it says, oh, I got an idea. How about if I store it in my roots where that's where I'm supposed to store? It? And so it digs down and makes new roots. And if it's digging new roots, it's exploring new areas that it wasn't getting its soil nutrition from before. And when you have that happen, lo and behold, it's like, oh my gosh, I just found a whole bunch more nutrients. I just gave myself a nutrient increase from a foliar feed. And it's not subtle to these plants. They get a little bit of extra stuff. I'm like, wow, new things begin to happen. If you want roots and you apply nitrates, sorry. If all you did was put in nitrates, you're going to get top growth. You're not going to get any roots. So if you're going to put nitrates in here, you better be putting some sugar with it to protect the plant first and foremost and try to give it some energy above and beyond what you're going to get for this top growth. Because until you do, you're only going to get top growth. The big numbers in the tank are not necessary. Why? Well, I hear this all the time. Um, you know, if I'm using one to three pounds of sugar per week, that's plenty. Do not have in your mind when you heard me talk about sugars at a pound or two to the acre, that if one to two pounds is good, five to 10 is better because I can afford it. No, 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 no. Because a couple of things happen. The plant can't pull in all that stuff all at once. It sits on top of each other and forms a little bit of a, of a barrier. And the more sugar that sits on the surface of a leaf, fungus will come along and fall onto the sugars, find food sources and grow like crazy on the surface of a leaf. So you don't want to oversupply that. Now, a lot of people think that that's also gonna draw insects. No, it's just the opposite. Typically sugars repel insects. They don't want anything to do with the sugar. Sugar, they don't have the ability to, to, to kick sugar out of their body. They don't want anything to do with sugar. That's why they hit the weakest places of the fields first. Those are lower in sugars inside the leaf tissue. That's why they eat there first. And then they spread out as the plant, uh, the, the, the field stresses. So sugars are a repellent. So you don't want aphids, you don't want mites. The better job you do of putting sugar on more frequently above and below the leaves, you don't get aphid and mite infestations very easily. Very, very rare that that happens if you're actually putting sugar on, especially if you're using it frequently. Now, you're spreading your sugar applications between three and four week applications. Yeah, I mean, the sugars fall, you're going to get them. But if you're trying, if you know they're in the area and you're trying to keep them out, a little insecticide with a, a pretty good dose of sugar, you're not going to have infestations. Small quantities are, are more frequently are typically better than big quantities in, at one time especially in dry land. Irrigation gives you some options because you know if you're putting it on, letting it absorb for a day, 24 hours, and then turning the water on and you're washing, washing the leaves off, you can probably do a little more. But, uh, and, and that energy would go down to the soil and then feed the soil and feed it in reverse. So you can do a few more things in there, but you gotta be careful how much you put on. It's not necessary to get much above three pounds at any one time in that patient. You're better off put on three pounds twice a week, then you are to try to think about putting six pounds on once. It's not, it's not as efficient, okay? So how can low amounts of sugar make more beans when the numbers don't support it? I mean, you're, you're hearing the university say, I don't know who you're listening to, but if you put on a pound of sugar, a pound of sugar is not gonna make three or four or five, six bushels of beans. The carbon, the energy transfer, it doesn't work. And if you actually listen to them, you're right. If that's what you're looking at and thinking you're accomplishing, it won't work. Uh, if, a plant, if a plant needs six pounds of carbon to make a pound of nitrogen, the numbers don't work. So how could it possibly be working? Well, all, what happens oftentimes is when you put sugar on, you relieve certain stress mechanisms in the plants. So that instead of burning their sugar to fight the stress, you're providing the sugar to fight the stress and letting the plant move ahead. Purdue University did work back 30 plus years ago on putting sucrose on the leaf. They know that when you put sucrose sugar on the leaf, the first thing the plant does is it takes that sugar and it feeds the nodules on the plant because that's an allowed infection. And it costs me energy to allow them to be there. And as a result of doing that, if I keep the, no, uh, the nodules on through the stress periods, the nitrogen manufacturing continues forward. And there's the prettiest green plants you've ever seen, in some cases, the worst drought you've ever experienced. I've had a guy do that back, back 25 years ago. I told him you got to put a pound to two pounds of sugar on every week, once a week. 
when you get into the drought and you must go to the end of the drought. That drought lasted six weeks, but every Monday morning, like the camper, the true camper that he was, he was out there in the morning with his sprayer and he'd put on nitrogen. That was a, a 40 or an 80, 80 acre field. I can't remember back how big it was, but everybody in the area was watching him and they're like, oh, don't pay any attention to him. He's crazy. But those beans were black green all summer. And at the end of the summer, the average in that area was 43 bushels, 40 to 43 bushels. And that field averaged 72. So now everybody's like, okay, what were you putting on out there? Got my attention. What kind of nitrogen were you using? He said, I wasn't using any nitrogen. Well, what were you putting on there? Sugar. <laughs> right, right. No, the sugar was the best nitrogen program management system there was because the nodules never left. And the nodules only make amine forms of nitrogen, which program for what? Yield, roots and yield. These plants weren't tall, they weren't viney, they were blue-green, black-blue-green, and loaded with pods. All he put on was nitrogen one, once a week at one to two pounds, and he fought his way through the drought. Was 30 bushels worth the trip? It was. Hard part was, I can't give up in the middle of a time when I think I should be, because it's like, there's no water here. What I tell you back at the early part of this, the more sugars a plant has, the less water it needs to complete its cycle. Now, because you kept the sugars up, the roots didn't stop either. So there's water down in there. As long as I keep my roots chasing the water, I'll be fine. But what plants do is when it starts to dry out and they burn the stress, those roots are high energy demand. They kind of stop growing the roots and kind of take care of themselves to finish their seeds. When they stop growing the roots and you separate that water by more than about two or three inches, water isn't coming back up to the roots anymore. Organic acid, humic acid, sugars can all be combined in an effort to make long-term energy release. Um, this is all part of the system. And, and the reason I jumped to that one because the piece right before it, how can the low amounts of sugar make a difference? Light refraction. <laughs> you spray light, or you spray sugar on the surface of a plant and you get a prism effect. You get sugars out there, you get microbes out there. They all cause light to be actually prismatic and it spreads out the spectrum. And instead of having a light beam go down and only hit a very few cells, it spreads out that spectrum and gets you blue light on a larger area. And if you do your homework, like good researchers have done at the university, they figured out that the blue light range causes carbon dioxide to be formed in huge quantities in the cells of the plants if it's available. And the more carbon dioxide you have, you run the photosynthesis machine. And when you run the photosynthesis machine at a higher rate, you get more sugar. So one pound of sugar generates huge amounts of sugar inside the plant, in some cases, only through light refraction. Physics. Who wanted to study physics to grow soybeans? <laughs> Chemistry was bad enough. What about hormones? When using hormones to influence plant growth, you always use energy if you're smart to allow the plant to respond without using all its resources. If you tell a plant, I'm going to give you hormones, I want you to flower or branch for me, or I want you to root for me. If you bring in energy, it takes that energy immediately and kind of redistributes it with the program that you just gave the plant. And lo and behold, something happens. Like tomorrow, you'll start to see the buds are already swelling if you've used, if you've used branching hormones. The buds are already swelling and starting to pop because you gave it energy. When you told it, I want you to do this, it has the energy to immediately make it happen. Speaking of hormones. There are hormones for root development and branches or flowers. Branching hormones give you branches or flowers. Root hormones give you roots. Don't confuse them or the plant. Many of the businesses that are well-intentioned out here today are combining root hormones with branching hormones. And hormones, if you think about it, are always designed to make something react and, and start a process. If you're trying to send both of these processes into high gear at, at one time, oftentimes it just confuses the plant. It may pick one or the other, but typically it, it doesn't do well at all. If you even separate them by just 24 or, or 36 or 48 hours, different one, then you'll see both things happen. But when you throw them all at once, it doesn't work. And guys are like, well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to spray two things separately. Well, that's right, because typically you're not necessarily using both of them together. 
But if you've got a decent root mass already under your plant and you want the plant to go to branching, then spray branching hormones. Don't spray branching hormones with rooting hormones. The way those work, if you want to look at a package, typically you have three hormones on a package. You've got kinetin or cytokinins. You've got gibberellic acid. And you've got either ABA or IBA. And whenever you look at the package, if you look at the percentages, and they're really low, but you look at the percentages. And if you have a percentage that's higher in kinetin or cytokinin, their kinetin is just the, the technical name for manufactured cytokinins. More chemistry, right? Sorry, I'm confusing you, but there's the point. Look at the levels. If the levels of cytokinins in the percentages are higher than the gibberellic acid, you have a flowering or branching hormone. If your levels of gibberellic acid or ABA or IBA are higher than the kinetin levels stated, you have a, 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 a rooting hormone. More gibberellic acid, more roots. More kinetins or cytokinins, more branches, okay? Lots of emphasis has been placed on hormones and boron in the recent programs, and why is that? Well, the irony is some hormones require boron as a precursor for the formation. Got to have boron, don't have boron, you don't make hormones. So it's like, wow, I've been using these hormones and they work really well. I have never used a pound of boron in my life. I don't know what to do with that, but I've been using the hormones and I'm having really good results. Okay, but if there is no substitute element for boron in the plant, when you use the hormones, it's like, well, I didn't have to make them, I just bought them. So if you've ever used them in conjunction with each other, it's like, wow, I, you know, I'm still using them. I'm still getting it, uh, advantages, but I don't get the same advantages I did before. And that's because if you're bringing in the boron and the plant's absorbing it and it's making the hormones, it's not as responsive to the hormones because it's making some of its own. Now, it's still not making enough in some cases to give you maximum branching. So a little bit of hormone goes a long way, but you probably will find if you're starting to use boron, <coughs> excuse me, you can drop the boron level or excuse me, the hormone levels in the mix and still get the same response. Other elements like moly and copper are very, very similar. If you've ever seen this whole idea of the hormones, all it is is apical dominance. And you've seen, this with, you've seen this with chemical pruning. You've seen it with hail. You've seen it with physical pruning from deer, where you actually, on the left, you see the lateral buds are down there in the juncture where the leaves attach to the main stem. And apical dominance just means, apical means top. The top of the plant or the end of the plant has the auxins that are telling the plant, I'm in charge here. You can't, your buds can't pop because I'm in charge. When you come along and you chop off the top of the, the tallest branch on the top of the plant, lo and behold, the buds down below, as you see on the right side there, the buds pop and they start to grow branches. If you've ever seen hail take out the top leaf or two of your young soybean plant, in the cotyledons, there's a bud on either side. And once you take off the top, both of those buds typically pop. And now you've got a plant with two main stems at the end of the season and some branches off of it rather than one. And we do this all the time with our shrubs around our houses. We go around, we trim the outside, we talk, take the top off and the sides off, and lo and behold, it gets nice and bushy. It still grows a little bit later on, but it gets nice and bushy and it fills in. It's all full of all these nice little buds because that's how the plants work. How about biologicals on the leaf surface? Live microbes are showing responsiveness. We put on new of these new biostimulants that are live microbes. Why, why do they respond? Makes no sense. It's like, this, it's just microbes. Well, <coughs> excuse me, in some cases, it's a biofilm covering, the biofilm being the surface of the leaf. We actually can coat that surface with things that keep other things from falling onto it, like fungus. If fungus falls on the surface of a leaf and it looks around and says, oh yes, this is a waxy cuticle of the surface of a leaf, the spore is like a seed and it germinates and it sends down a fungal peg and it starts infecting. If it lands on a bunch of microbes that physically keep it from getting to the surface and it looks around, it's like, well, I'm sitting on something, but I'm not sitting on a leaf. So it doesn't germinate. So the spore doesn't really infect. So you can have a physical covering. The other thing is microbes, when they sit on the surface of a leaf, sometimes they can actually convert phosphorus that's blowing across the, the, the dust and landing on the surface, gets a little moisture from, from uh, humidity or, uh, or dew and it recognizes the phosphorus here and it can actually melt the phosphorus out on the surface of the leaf and the phosphorus can be absorbed by the plant. So it can convert things on the surface of a leaf. The other thing that's very interesting and we've seen this just recently because of the work that's been done is biosignaling. Microbes actually send out biosignals when they're sitting on the surface of a leaf down through the plant and they talk to the microbes at the roots. Now I realize 
that starts making us look like the aliens on the planet, because these are really, really advanced scenarios, but they've already been proven. And we'll talk a little bit about that here in a few minutes. Also light diffraction, same thing with sugars. When light hits sugar, it's kind of a prism effect and it spreads out. Many microbes have a similar effect when they're on the surface and light goes through them because they're very, very thin, <coughs> the light is refracted or diffracted and it spreads out. And lo and behold, you get a higher increase in this blue light and an increase in uh, bio, uh, photosynthesis. And then there are hormonal influencing um, stress management pieces that uh, many of the plant uh, microbes that are beneficial will produce hormones and they will actually help the plants manage stress a little bit better. So there are some bioregulations that take place when microbes are sitting on the surface. Now this microbe interaction is fascinating. This is a picture in, in obviously the, the UV realm where we get the same idea if you put a shirt on with yellow printing on it, you walk under a black light and all of a sudden you just see the yellow or maybe a little bit of green. The same thing happens in plants. Certain microbes that sit on the surface send out signals to say, hey, we're out here protecting the biofilm, the leaf surface. You need to come and protect the roots. And one of those, two of those organisms, one of them is called Bacillus subtilis that you see here. Another one is called Pseudomonas fluorescens. Why do you think it call, they call it fluorescens? Because in UV light, it fluoresces. Now, the irony of all this is when that light is being reflected, we don't see it with our eyes, but the plant roots do. And when that light is actually being reflected out from those different microbes, guess what? When you start looking at the new biocides, the new biological um, fungicides in a sense, those microbes, as they're fluorescing that color, they bring light to a dark world and they keep the dark guys, the bad guys that come in here to kill the roots, they keep them away. Look how they grow. This is, this is not one microbe. This is colonies, thousands of colonies of microbes going around the hair roots. And so by spraying microbes on the leaf, if you have the right microbes around the roots, which you can actually buy and, and, and propagate right now in seed treatments or or infero, or even spraying them on the surface. If those microbes are down there and they are signalable, if you will, they come to protect the root masses. Fascinating stuff. And it was proven by the University of Delaware and the University of Georgia both. What are the benefits to the plant? Well, we already talked about some of the nutritional benefits. Protection, many of them are not labeled to do this. I mean, you know, I, I actually just, for full information, I am a partial owner in a biological company and we do like microbes. But the whole idea is we don't necessarily want a label for protection. If I tell you that I control Pythium or Phytophthora with my microbes, I'm supposed to have a EPA registration. I might know that, but I can't make those claims. But if, if you actually do some of the research, you find all kinds of neat and wonderful things have already happened. But I have to spend millions of dollars and increase the price of the product that I want to go to. And then growth hormones. If you're making root growth hormone around the root mass in the soil, in the soil solution, Roots grow to where those hormones are. So another session done here, foliar summary. We need to use properly formulated products to get stuff in. If we don't, it either sits on the surface, never goes in, burns, or gets washed off. So using the proper forms of fertility when we make these products up makes all the difference in the world to program the plants correctly. Wrong nitrogen, wrong program. Always use food to stimulate and sustain growth management and stress tolerance. Sugar means stress relief to a plant. And one to two pounds of sugar per application, I don't care whether you're throwing in a herbicide or an insecticide or a fungicide or a foliar feeding program with a, with a, with a reason, they should always have some sugar in there to manage stress and give the plant the ability to respond to what you're trying to accomplish so that it doesn't have to use its own reserves. If it does have to use its reserves, oftentimes it has to pull from the root masses to get it done. And the more you pull from the root masses, you're not harvesting as much nutrition. And if you understand this and you are timing the applications appropriately to the thing that you wanna have. So for instance, we go back to the, that, if we got a little too much valor or sharpen or something in my soybean plants and they're sitting there and they're not growing throw in some amino acids because it's amino acids that are being hurt and shut down. And that's why the plant isn't growing. A little bit of amino acids, a little sugar, and a little uh, ethylene inhibitor, which we'll cover here in a little while. 
And all of a sudden, 24 hours later, the roots pop, the plant greens up, and in 36 to 48 hours, it's, take, it's taken off. And you're sending me pictures with your phone saying, I never knew this was even possible. And so instead of sitting there for three weeks doing nothing, just like that, they're back in gear and growing, and you don't lose three weeks of valuable growing time. Okay. All right. I think, yeah, that's it. So we got, Jeff, we got any questions? Uh, yeah, we got one here. Um, um, uh, somebody got called away for a few minutes back when you were talking in uh, oh, man. Boron, that's, boron that's hard. and uh, yeah. uh, recommend, recommendations for boron at what soil test levels? Normally, when we get soil test levels back from uh, most of the most of the testings, you need to be, I mean, preferably you need to be at one to two parts per million of actual boron in the soil system. Um, one part per million is two pounds per acre. So you're looking, if it's done in pounds per acre, it needs to be somewhere between two and four pounds of actual boron per acre. Very few soil samples ever are that way. So if you're looking at a soil test and it's done in parts per million, if you are at or below 0.5, you're costing yourself significant yield. A lot of the ones we get back are 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3. And we see just that fast, 20, 30, 40 bushels of corn, easily 10 to 20 bushels of soybeans if they're that low. If guys are like, I don't know what I don't know what's caused my plateau out here in these fields. I have good beans, they look good, they just don't perform. Well, if there's not enough boron, you're only gonna make so many pods, so many seeds, right? You pop in the boron and lo and behold, the plants are more efficient at moving the sugar around. They start reproducing. They make the hormones. They branch better. More nodes, more nodes, more flowers, more pods. It just starts making sense. So if you're at or below 0.5 parts per million, or if it's in pounds per acre, and you're less than one pound per uh, one to two pounds per acre, you need to be putting in boron. And if it's in dry fertilizer, you shouldn't put on more than one or two pounds of actual. So that's somewhere in the vicinity of seven to 10 pounds, um, no more than 15 pounds of boron in a dry fertilizer blend. And oftentimes boron isn't the same size as the other granules. And so as you're driving across the field, they're settling down and one, one part of the field may get an over application, or if you're doing the spreading or someone else is doing the spreading and they're overlapping too far, you don't wanna put in too much to get these levels so high in the field that you'll get toxic because too much boron can be a problem. So we limit it to one to two pounds maximum actual per acre in a dry spread. Or if you're gonna spray and you're gonna foliar feed or you wanna put it into bands, typically about a quart of 10% is enough to really kind of uh, kickstart the engine and get you a response. Once you've worked with it a little bit, you can use a little more at different times, but you need to know what you're doing. So work with somebody who understands that boron application but one to two pints of boron in most all crops and in, in, in most typical applications is not too much that it's gonna hurt you. So you can do it You can do it that way. If you wanna put a little solubor in uh, with, with burned down herbicides, again, limit yourself to about one to two pounds of actual boron per acre and you should be fine. Okay. okay. Um, why don't we take a little five minute bottle yep. break here uh, before we do this, I want to I'm going to be touching on this at at, at the very end here. Um, we do have CCA credits available for this, and that will be uh, made available at the end of the end of the presentation. And for anybody that's tuned with us that has not or is not a member of the Kentucky Soybean Association or has a membership that needs to be renewed. Um, it's time to do that, folks. Uh, so either call the office or go on the website at uh, KentuckySoy.org, and uh, we can we can help you uh, get your membership, uh, either get you signed on or renewed. So uh, with that, we'll take us five minutes, and we'll see everybody back here in just a couple. Thanks. I'm gonna make a quick pit myself, so I'll be right back. Yep, me too. <laughs>
All right. Let's see. Dan, I think we've got we've got some questions here. Okay. Uh, it looks like first one, I'll just take your um, uh, question. Can we get a copy? Uh, this, this is being recorded. Uh, we will uh, have a link up on our website um, by, probably by tomorrow. Um, so anybody that wants to uh, go back and review uh, some portions of it, I know I'm going to. Uh, it <laughs> I would say be thank a, God it's being recorded. Yeah. <laughs> if you're not lost yet, you're uncommon. Okay. I mean, there's a lot um, of stuff here. I realize. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. I was kind of, kind of jokingly, somebody said a bowel break. We probably needed a little bit of a, of brain. a brain yeah. uh, break and, um, uh, but it's all good stuff. And uh, let's see. Uh, could you touch on pH levels and how they affect different strains of biologicals in the soil? First part having heard high or low can kill them before uh, they become beneficial. Okay. That's a good question. Um, normally what you're going to find, um, you know, it's ironic, the, 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 the perfect balance, and we're going to cover this uh, briefly in, in this up, up, upcoming piece. The perfect balance is about 60 to 70% calcium, 10 to 20% magnesium and three to 5% potash. And when you do that, and, and 10 to 15% acid, your pH will be 6.3. Now, 6.3 puts you in the moderately acidic area. The reason that's perfect for the soil is that allows the nutrients to dissolve because there's enough acid to dissolve the nutrients and keep the maximum availability of nutrients. But it also maintains a beautiful range of pH for both fungus, which, it, which prefers acidic conditions, and bacteria, which prefers alkaline conditions. And so if you're right at 6.3, everybody's playing together. And it's funny in the soil, one man's trash is another man's treasure. Fungus is very, very good at breaking down organic matter and micro, uh, bacteria can be too, but bacteria are better at making out small pieces and releasing fertility back to the plant. So again, we look at the big picture in the integration, that pH at 6.3 with a proper balance now because you can get pH 6.3 with really, really bad calcium levels and high magnesium or high sodium or potash. Or you could get it with pretty good calcium, but no potash or magnesium, all kinds of things. It's a proper balance. And, we'll, and I'll, I'll cover that here in a little while. But in all cases, the secret lies, it's almost like the, the, the treasure movie, like the secret lies with Charlotte. The secret in soil now, because we've done a lot of bacteriology is fungi. And the mycologists who study Mycorrhiza or myco meaning fungi, the myco fungi people are the ones that have the biggest gains that are yet to come. And when we actually get really good fungus, fungal strains that we can get to survive in these scenarios, and many of you are already using mycorrhizae, if you can use mycorrhizae at pH 6.3 with all the systems, you're probably already rocking and rolling. If you figured that out from other, other um, seminars like this that you've gone to, that's where you're gonna get the biggest bang from the buck is around the low low uh, sixes is where you're gonna maximize out. Okay. Uh, Jeff, I'm assuming that since you checked out, we're gonna go ahead and move right on into part three. Um, and again, I, I love that whole idea of crop opportunities. I, I think that's fantastic, but this is exactly what we're talking about. Crop opportunities, Obviously, we see where the crop goes, but crop opportunities and making a better crop here. I love that idea. I'd like to steal that, but I think it's probably trademark. Anyway, what can we do to marry some of these things together into a big program? Because that's the whole point. Uh, you know, it's not like I'm going to tell you so many pounds of this, that, and the other. I am going to share a little bit about that. But you have to understand that you may, un you need to kind of grasp what's the biggest missing piece in the puzzle right now. And for, for many of you, it may just be simply getting some better micronutrient needs into the plant through foliar programs. And that's where I find most of the work that I'm doing with my people, either getting biology around the soybean to make sure that the iron is there for the nodules to form or getting the balance of nutrition with some micronutrients and energy in the starter for the soybean or right on the surface of the, of the plant, uh, you know, as, as, it, as it's starting to grow or later on, you know, with some of the boron that's missing and some of the other stuff foliar all together as a program. That's the whole idea of this. Be careful of the one word, programs to improve productivity. One word with a dual meaning, program. We have bought 
programs for years. And we have the guy that we go down and buy our fertility program from it's because we've always done it. So we think of that as we buy the products and they fit into a big piece and we call it a program. But we may not understand that when we put nutrients either in the solution or on the plant, nutrients mean a program to a plant. Nitrogen in the nitrate form tells it to grow profusely. Nitrogen in an amine form taint says either grow roots and build sugars or reproduce. Boron means flow sugars up to the upward portion, back and forth between the roots and the tops. Program yield potential. Each piece of the puzzle is a program. Too much potash would say I need to move a lot of water because if I got so much salt, so much potash, I got to have a lot of water to dilute it. Once I run a lot of water and I dilute the sugars, my productivity goes down. So I better use potash sparingly and properly. They represent programs to a plant. So I get soil tests, traditional soil tests. And this was, this was a, a case where we were actually just kind of studying the difference between actually using microbial treatments compared to not. And in this particular insta instance, what I was trying, uh, what we were trying to prove to the people that were asking about it was if all you did was improve the root mass, you can improve the uptake of nutrients and we can do that very successfully. But what happens is if you have lots of available fertility or lots of fertility that's not on the available chart, but you crank up the microbes, oftentimes the numbers change. And this particular information in the, in the, the, the area between the row, which was where the plants started, all the soils, you see the, the levels are in the low to medium range, which means low to medium is where the range is. And what that means is when you have the letters on there, What's the potential response for adding nutrients? That's what the whole test was about to begin with. I actually told them to take the letters off because the letters were only confusing people. But low means there's a better chance of response economically to, a, to applied fertilizer. But in this case, if you look at the phosphorus, starting area between the row was in the low to medium category. You check the row where the microbes were actually put in there and lo and behold, it went to the medium and high jump to the potash. It was in the low category between the row, but where you put the microbes in the row and cranked up the biological activity, it went from the low category up to the high. Look at the iron. I was telling you a while ago about iron over uh, down, down below under iron. Iron was at 27 in the high, very high category, but oftentimes it's, it's confusing because iron is not always available even when it says it is, but it jumped from 27 to 69. How is it you make iron chlorosis go away? You crank biology up and say, look, I need some iron. And all of a sudden nodules appear everywhere on those beans that they haven't been before. And I didn't put any more nodulating bacteria. Just got better nodulation. I don't understand how. Didn't put any nodulating bacteria, no rhizobium. Bam, just like that. All these changes aren't subtle. But even on a traditional test, you can prove some of these points to yourself if you know what you're looking for. And a lot of it is now when we're looking at uh, Solvita tests, the Haney tests, a whole lot more things that actually include biology as a predictor of what's going on in that soil. If you understand that carbon dioxide is what runs the photosynthesis machine and you do carbon dioxide tests, these burst tests to help us understand if there's biology working underneath our canopy and we got a lot more carbon dioxide here under the canopy, the canopy sucks up the carbon dioxide, makes more sugar, gets more yield. And there's a whole lot of other tools in the tool belt. And that's really, if all you think about this today as is understanding that your tool belt just put on a whole bunch more sites for tools. And all you're doing is reaching for different tools at different times. That's what the whole idea of biostimulants and programming is all about. We talked about the optimum cation balance a while ago. If you wanna go back to that soil test, if you actually get a soil test and you wanna get it balanced, this is what the balance should look like. Now, it's not necessarily just for nutrients. We think that when we balance it, it's for nutrients and nutrients because of what I'm putting there. The biggest reason is air water management. When you have calcium dominating your, your exchange sites, calcium holds a really nice soft shell of water that's readily available to biology and plants both. And it will exchange water. It will keep the soil from shrinking and swelling badly. It will basically maintain a very, very good air water management and biological ecology. When you get too little magnesium, 
or in this case, way too much magnesium for a lot of guys in the world. And, and you guys in Kentucky, typically it's a little too little. Magnesium is the center of the chlorophyll molecule. So if you want to keep a plant nice and green and get a lot more chlorophyll to make more sugar, you got to have magnesium. If you run low in magnesium, got some bad news for you. You can only run, chlor uh, you can only run photosynthesis at a certain rate. So you got to get more magnesium inside the tissue. If you get too much magnesium in your soil test, that magnesium is a much smaller molecule than calcium, but it holds a great big shell of water tightly bound to itself. And so it causes, with all that water, it causes clays to shrink and swell dramatically. And because the water is held so tightly, it won't release it. So you get out in the middle of a summer where you got clay with a lot of magnesium on it, or even silt, but a lot of magnesium on it. It's not the same on sand, but on silts and clays, it shrinks, it swells, it gets nasty, it gets sticky. You go out in the middle of summer, you kick the soil. It's like, well, I don't know what's wrong here. It looks like I got moisture in my soil. The plant's sitting here droughty. It's because the plants can't extract the water. So if you've got high magnesium lime as your only source and you're way, way, way too high in magnesium, your soil's messed up from its chemistry. And it's because the physical conditions are falling apart and you need to fix that. And that's a whole nother story. So you get 60 to 75% like on your, on your silts and your clays, you wanna be closer to 75% calcium. On the magnesium, you wanna be down closer to 10 to 12%. On the sands, it's just the opposite. You're only gonna get about 60 to 65% calcium and you want to be up to 20, maybe even 22% on really low CEC sand for magnesium. Potash, not as critical on soybeans, but you do have to be careful. Too much potash too early will limit some of the branching and the nodal development. Uh, we just learned about this recently. It's just starting to show up that if we put on more than 100 or 150 pounds of potassium on either corn or beans, that we can actually upset the apple cart and we'll take the top end. It'll still produce but it won't go top in for us. We've, I've known that for 25, 30 years. And I tell people that all the time about their corn. Be careful, you, can't over, you should not oversupply potash until you know the years of corn. And we can prove that indefinitely. That's a whole nother seminar. Sodium we don't deal with. So, so basically potash, if you're somewhere in the vicinity of two to 3% potassium in most all soils, if you're right at 3% everywhere all the time, you're in pretty good shape. This business of trying to go up to 10% that we've been hearing out in the, out in the business out here, that is not going to give you top end time and time again. Unless you balance it out, it's a whole nother story. And I would be very, very careful about listening to people who say you need to blow the potash through the roof. If you don't know what you're doing, you're asking for a good butt kicking. That's what you're asking for because it doesn't work if you don't balance it with the rest of the system. Ammonium and traces, we don't really measure them that much, but 1%. Hydrogen, acid, pH, 10 to 15% acid allows you to melt those metals and stimulate fungus and keep a nice balance of everything. And so your pH, if you get it in these ranges is gonna be pretty darn close to 6.3. It might be 6.2 up to 6.5, but it's a very good balance. And these are soils, when I get soil tests that people hand me, I'm like, oh, these are your two, two or three best fields. And these three fields over here are the ones you fight day in and day out. And they look at me and their eyes get really big and they're like, who told you about my farm? I'm like, I've never talked to anybody about your farm. You show me your soil tests. Well, no one's ever told me that. I mean, what are you, some kind of wizard or something? I'm like, no, the numbers represent ideas and programs. If you know what the elements mean and how they do it, they'll tell you things about your soil. Oh, it's funny how these high mag soils have low phosphate levels because high mag soils have no air. When you have no air, you don't have good biology. And if you don't have good biology, you don't release phosphate. So you're constantly putting phosphate in here. You get a test that gives you Bray P1 and Bray P2 instead of the same old Malix. And the Bray P1 might be down in the single digits for phosphorus because the Bray P1 tells you what the phosphorus is today. The Bray P2 tells you what's close to being made available, could be made, made available in a few days or a few weeks or a few months. And the Bray P2 might be 40, 50, 70, 100. You got single digits in the P1 and double or triple digits in the P2 because your biology can't work. And it's all sitting there ready to come to you if you could just get some more air in your soil. Fascinating stuff. What functions do microbes possess and how do they work? I, I purposely kind of avoided the whole idea of biostimulants at the start of the, the program because the government is now actually taking, and they have definitions for biostimulants and live microbes do specific things and your hormones and your sugars and your humic acids and your fulvic acids. And many of the things are now being categories, thank God, because you know there's been a lot of confusion. 
but specifically on microbes. Microbes do just about everything that all these other things can do, except provide lots and lots of readily available energy. Energy and food is entirely different from microbes. They, they transform food into available stuff, but they don't necessarily provide you the food, okay? So live microbes interact directly with plant roots in exchange for the sugars and amino acids that plants give off to feed them and signal to them. They use some of those as signals to the microbes to tell them what to do. So they should be there. Bacteria, fungus, actinomycetes, all kinds of things should be there and the plant sustains them around their roots for that specific reason. The roots get bigger, the plant gets healthier, the plant gets bigger, more food is made and it's shipped to the soil so the microbes can make more babies. That's how it works, it's a give and take. The main reason they're there is to find food and reproduce, that's what they do. They just have learned to you know, very well interact with these plants because if they give the plants what they want, funny how they get more in return. Microbes release acids and enzymes to cause chemical and biological reactions to take place. We don't have time to get into the enzymes and enzymology today but realize that organic acids and enzymes are actually how they do it. So if you wanna go do your homework and find out what enzymes are, it's fascinating stuff. They manufacture compounds that release nutrients from minerals, especially phosphorus and iron, and in some cases nitrogen, but especially some of those micronutrients. They break down old fertilizer that's been locked up for years. Every time you made phosphate applications through the years in dry fertilizer, the Phosphate and Potash, Potash and Phosphate Institute and the TVA informed people for decades, it's even in their written materials, that if you get more than 50% of the phosphate that you bought in fertilizer out of the soil and into your plants in your lifetime, you're above average. Now, a lot of people are worried that that phosphate went away. A lot of it's still there. It's one of the reasons why in some cases we don't recommend lots of phosphate anymore because if we crank up the biology, the phosphate comes oozing out of these soils and into those plants. You stimulate more root growth from oxygen and gibberellin production. These microbes have the ability to make root growth hormones so that the roots can grow to them and get bigger and they get fed better. They're smart. They, they're not really tricking the plants. You might say they are, but they're just drawing the plants in to be able to get the food that they want. They help plants maintain health and immunity by fighting disease via vitamin formation. There's vitamins that form. There are products that are given off by microbes that actually turn on the immune systems of plants. And when the microbes are around the plants and they're telling them we're here, you're safe, you're fine. They're telling them that it's fine. When you get a six inch rain overnight and it suffocates all those beneficial guys out and they can't signal to the plant anymore, plant doesn't know what to do to do with its immunity. It's, it's, it's sitting here like, I don't know what to do. What happens? That's when the bad guys move in and the root rots get produced. And since the plant doesn't know to turn on its immune system to fight the root rots, bam takes off the roots and the plants are setting your compromise. If you can just get microbes back around the roots as fast as you can, oftentimes you can save those plants and turn them back in the right direction. Break down organic matter, improve aggregation of the, of the soil around the roots. That's where a rich, healthy environment that you see in the fence row, when you dig around in there, you can do it with your hands. They, they produce all kinds of surfactants that actually make all those clays and silt particles aggregate and leave air and release nutrients and five places for water and places for microbes to live in and have homes, if you will, happy houses. They also fix atmospheric nitrogen and bring it into the rhizosphere, into the area of the right, mean, the rhizo means root and sphere means zone. So you got root zone, rhizosphere, technical name for it. And they produce biocontrol agents for insects, disease, and weed control, which again is a whole other subject. We haven't got time to get into all that today. So programs should take into consideration the crop to be grown, any crop in any situation, of course, in this time we're talking about soybeans, but all of us know that our brethren in the specialty crop industry must know their crop or just be really lucky. And, you know, some of them are, just have learned different things from different people. Programs should take into consideration all of the things that we have covered today. Because in trying to get top end yields, it's all these little incremental gains or incremental misses that cost us the big bushel. You know, jumping from 60 to 70, 75 is, in some cases, not that difficult, but to maintain 75, 80, 85, 90, 95, and 100, you want to be in the 100 bushel bean club, you better be doing a lot of these things right, because otherwise, every little piece extracts the yield. Soil health, as various organizations are stressing today, should be a major focus, because soil health is beginning to create the ecology in which these root masses and plants and root depths are accomplished and there's a lot more nutrient down below that you've never even seen before. And all you got to do is get the roots down there and get them working in that system and they can extract it. You can put ammonium nit nitrogen fertilizer on the plant 
and cause uh, hydrogen to be released all through that root system, even down in the subsoil where the pH might be eight and a half or nine or 10 and extract nutrients. Building in better biology and soil chemistry balance is the primary goal because they work together now. You begin to see how this is starting to fit together. All of these things have to be addressed. Fertilizer efficiency, not elimination, okay? This is not an anti-fertilizer discussion. I know I can hear it. I can already hear him now. I'm not listening to that guy. He doesn't want to use fertilizer anymore. Oh, no, no. You need fertilizer at certain levels, but you don't need excesses because excesses, it's always easier to come from underneath and build a little in and get a better response than in just to go out here and throw it all out there at high levels and say, oh, the plant will figure it out. And I messed up all my chemistry and my test tube and my big beaker. All this chemistry is reacting in the soil and it's all tying each other up and there ain't nothing going on. And I don't know why. And right at pH seven, that's the worst place you can be. pH seven is the worst place you can be because that's neutral. And even a little more alkalinity or a little more acidity would be smarter. Okay, and that's, that's again, another discussion, but you don't want to maintain yourself at pH seven. That's the absolute worst place to be. Fertilizer efficiency has got to be a goal of maximum production. That's what you need to do. Good uh, quality and quantity of produce is achievable and economically profitable without excessive inputs if you do your homework. And I have a lot of guys that I work with and you know they still today scratch their heads like how in the world can we put in less and get out more? That makes no sense to me. And it's because they don't realize that they're not measuring the totality of fertility being made available throughout a whole soil system. There are hundreds and thousands of pounds of of elements, of minerals in the top zero to eight, 10, 12 inches. I mean, each, each acre for a slice weighs 2 million pounds. And if there are thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of pounds of potash in our part of the world, and thousands of pounds in parts of Kentucky of, of potash, but sometimes the potash is lower and the phosphate is higher. You get all the way around Lexington, my gosh, the phosphate can be into the hundreds of pounds naturally just from the minerals. They sh it shows up on the soil test. That's the case, you gotta be thinking, I gotta be putting in some micronutrients to maximize the availability of it and probably chelated micronutrients. And the five guys who farm around there, it's all, all of a sudden these soils have developed a whole new world when we change the balance of their nutrition. Take the order of things seriously, first things first. I don't know why we put all the fertilizer to try to make ourselves through a whole year the year before. We got establishment, we've got early growth, pre-flower, flower, potting, pod set, pod put. All of these things, first things first. Start with what you know, soil and seeds. For soybeans, you got maturity, you got stand, and good establishment is key. You can, you gotta do whatever you can to get uniformity. If, if Randy Dowdy has taught us nothing except what the value of uniform, uniformity is, he's always gonna be remembered for that. Because he's right, and we all know that. If we see uniform fields, we're always excited about uniform fields because they've ceased competing with each other, each individual plants, and they grow as a factory, a machine all at once. Here on, on the upper point is, is a seed treatment with biology put in it and fungicide. So where you see the lines kind of stop it, where he turned around on the end, he had a few left in there, and then all of a sudden the rest of it was just on seed fungicide. The ones on the right have biology in it. Now those were out of the ground seven to eight days sooner than the ones on the left. The first question I had to that guy was, what was your fungicide? He's like, why would you care? He says, you should be pushing biology. I said, I'm pushing biology, but the number one thing people talk about in seed treatments is I got to use fungicide. I can't trust biology to be my fungicide. But if biology actually tells the plants to germinate, gets them out of the ground and works around the root masses and gets me out of the ground faster, and my fungicide didn't kill my biology because it won't. That's the first thing. Like, will fungicide kill your biology? No, it won't. We get the right stuff. Now, if all you're using is mycorrhizal fungus, and you overdo your fungicide, you may be in trouble. But if you're using bacteria, fungicides don't kill bacteria. So lo and behold, here you go. The other thing is down below, this is where um, people were using stubble digesting organisms to make the stubble become basically eggshells. And in a wet spring, you see their equipment was able to get penetration into the soil on the left, where on the right, where all the, the corn stalks were, the planter was riding up because the stalks were still intact. I mean, they were still, they were still tough. Same field, same planting date, same everything, same population, different stand. This guy ended up getting 63 bushels on the left, 39 on the right. Now the, the advanced soil uh, snake oil salesman says, look, I can get you another 23 bushels. No, he didn't get him 23 bushels. He didn't go from 63 to 86. 
He just did not lose what he invested in, in his normal scenario. It should have been somewhere around 60 to 65 bushels, and he didn't lose it. He protected the yield against loss. That's exactly what this is about. So establishment and uniformity are key. And anything that allows you to happen that, whether you've got to make it updates on your equipment, fertility improvements that won't overcome this. If you don't get uniformity, it doesn't matter what your fertilizer is. Oversupplies of fertilizer, if you don't understand that, and you're ignorant of it, learn about it. Ignorance is excusable, okay? Ignorance is normal. We don't know what we don't know. But once we know what we know and we refuse to go some of those ways, that's when stupidity enters, uh, enters in. You can't fix stupidity, all right? That's a, that's a rough road to hoe. And I've watched that for years. And I've seen people actually finally, in some cases, admit to that. And they're like, I think I'm making some mistakes, okay? Overplanting doesn't make things better, better typically with soybeans. Uh, you're gonna get single stems. And so that's fine if you su can support that population, but you're not gonna get good branching. Or if you wanna get branching out of single stems, you gotta pop it with some boron or some hormones and make those things happen. But the tighter you get and the more plants you get per square foot, when one plant gets sick, it's funny how they all seem to start getting sick. So soybean sudden death a syndrome oftentimes just rules the roost where you have some problems like that. If you can get soil biology rocking around the roots from the start, if you can, especially the iron releasers, stand back and look how many nodules you form. And when you make more nodules and you make more nitrogen and things are balanced, if you don't grow more soybeans, something's wrong. We talked about this before, that interaction. The fun part about this is now it's like if I do something to get biology better established around the roots when I plant them. They communicate with chemical signals. And if I can actually get them around the roots, I bought them and placed them where I want and they are interacting. Now, when I put the products on a foliar up onto the top, on the leaves, the nutrition changes, the protection aspect changes, hormonal changes happen and the roots get bigger. Did you know that 60% of your organic matter comes from roots, not tops? And so people in no-till systems are excited about their organic matter changes. But as they build bigger root masses into all the plants that they're growing on, less fertilizer and bigger roots, their organic matter in their soybeans seems to start to climb. It's fascinating. It's because the root masses are better. Little teeny tiny poor soybean root masses don't make much organic matter. But you get these things popping. I mean, we've got situations where we've investigated there in the Owensboro area, 22 inches down below the surface. We've got roots growing like I showed you in that picture from Auburn a while ago. Roots everywhere. And people initially, they thought it was weeds. Soybeans can't do this, they said. Soybeans can't do this. It's funny how that word can't gets used a lot in agriculture. But it was, it was all soybean roots. Massive amounts of roots deep in the soil. Now, that soil was silt loam. If it's clay or clay loam, it's gonna be harder to make that happen. But a good silt loam soil with, with plenty of air has a massive amount of roots in it. You start with energy in the furrow or over the top early if you can. So we're talking about sugars. We're talking about amino acids. We're talking about uh, humic acids, uh, fulvic acids. Plants are energy conversion machines. You saw the photosynthesis thing a while ago. From sunlight comes sugar. Common sense, sorry, I had an error there. Common sense tells you that a young plant with no roots and a couple of leaves is struggling. All right, you can't make enough. It's not making very, very good sunlight energy conversion, okay? You put some microbes or sugars, or organic acids on the seed when you plant it in the furrow or sprayed over the top early in its life to stimulate root growth. And lo and behold, you got a, I got a brand new different plant. Phosphorus is way more important early over nitrogen and potassium. You know, ammonium nitrogen, if you want some nitrogen is the right choice. Uh, that's why a lot of the guys are going to ammonium sulfate. They'll put out 100, 150 pounds per acre. Because of the nitrogen in the ammonium form, it will not upset the nodules. The only thing that takes nodules off a plant is nitrates. A lot of extra nitrates. And if you've got high, high uh, late season stock nitrates in your corn fodder from last year, and it's been bone dry all winter, and then you get a blow load of, of rain in the spring, it's funny how you dig up the plants because they're pretty, they seem to be pretty and they seem to be growing, but you pull them up and there's not a nodule on them. And you can't be found. And they won't be found for six weeks until the nitrate levels in that soil dissipate because it's all coming out of the old stalks and going through the soil. Plants are picking it up and they're trying to grow and they're getting stemmy and they're green, but you pick them up and there's no nodules, there's no nodules, there's no nodules. That's because nitrate is a chemical blocker signal to keep nodules from forming. Ammonium nitrogen will not do that. And you can foliar feed it, you can put it on the soil, 
uh, ammonium sulfate will break down for 30 to 45 days as a slow release nitrogen. And it will release copper, zinc, iron, manganese, phosphate. It releases a blow load of other, other nutrients in the soil wherever those granules land. Also, seed treatments don't have to be the most expensive in the industry. I mean, let's face it. Um, as, as seed producers don't feel like they can get all the value out of the genetics because it's limited, they're making a lot of money on the seed treatments. And the only way they're guaranteeing your seed for re replant is if you put them on there. I get it. But in most cases, there are other things you can do to supplement that system along with decent seed treatments, not overspend on the upfront cost, and you're going to be just as well off, well off as if you had spent you know, the biggest, biggest, biggest stuff. And all the chemicals in the world only last so long. But biology can last throughout the entire season if you know what you're doing. Care for the plant as it grows. Okay. So when we're early on the, on the VE emergence to R1, here's some ideas. Plants need a little fertility up front, but not boatloads. Okay. Moderate dry fertility and focus more on the uh, phosphorus, just like you're growing your lawn. You know, if you put a lot of phosphorus on your lawn, it's funny how you get better roots. You don't need as much nitrogen. As the plant gets bigger in your early pass, you put in some energy, some sugar, some fulvics and humix at, at one to two quarts. And some, you know, some growers like to throw in hormones when they're, when they're young. Every time you have a leaf connection, you can get a bud. So they'll throw in some hormone. Two to four ounces per acre is a normal rate. You don't need lots. And or boron, a quart of, of seven to 10% boron all the time, one to two pints, one to two pints, one half a quart to a quart does a really, really good job of, of, of bringing those boron levels up. And it maximizes branches when those hormones are there. And the total number of nodes and the sugar movement is, is, is maximized, okay? If roots are weak, you pound it with sugar and amino acids, one to two quarts, and go back and look what happens tomorrow. If you already see the evidence tomorrow. At flowering, when that, when that thing gets to R1, keep up the energy and the boron. And some stress relief, some ethylene inhibitors. We haven't talked much about ethylene inhibitors, but ethylene inhibitors keep the, they, they tell the plant, I know you see stress, don't pay any attention to it. It's a fascinating world of chemistry that's really made big, big gains. And you can do this for a couple bucks an acre. Each and every time that you spray, you can put on an ethylene inhibitor. One of the reasons our fungicides are doing some of the work is because some of them actually act as ethylene inhibitors. We don't really need them for uh, fungicides in many cases because there's nothing there to fight. But we use them because we're getting yield responses and we're getting yield responses because it's ethylene inhibition. If you take away the stress, put in boron to bring sugars up, put in sugar to bring sugars up, you got a plant that lasts through stress for seven to 10 days without any problem. It's fascinating. Other micronutrients like zinc, manganese, copper, moly, these make photosynthesis more efficient. Micronutrients are part of the enzyme system when the enzymes are being built. They call them cofactors. They set out on the end of these big enzyme molecules. And if they're not there, the enzyme doesn't work. So it spends all this energy to make enzymes and it doesn't have micronutrients to finish it. And lo and behold, the system's broke. It doesn't work as well. So you just don't get as much yield potential. We get into mid-season activity, R1 to R3. Bring in the energy. We've switched from vegetative growth to reproductive growth, huge energy demands. Bring in the energy. What forms the energy? Phosphates, sugars, humic acids, boron, and moly. Don't forget the moly because the moly is what helps that nodule make its nitrogen right. So that's why moly is being utilized. But don't get carried away. A lot of these guys are putting in huge amounts of moly. Very, very dangerous. You thought boron was hot. Watch what happens when you put boron with too much moly. It gets really hot. This improves branching and flowering and holds, and holds the pods during pod set. Extra boron helps tighten the internode length. If you're starting with boron and you stay on the boron through the whole program, your internodes are going to shorten because plants aren't in, as in, inclined to vine and branch. I'm sorry, to, to vine, they'll still branch, but as they branch, they don't vine, so they stay shorter. So it tightens up the internode length, and it also puts on more pods at every internode. Higher sugars improve flowering photosynthesis, nodulation, and nodule feeding, and holds the pods. You see in the middle of hot, dry seasons, you go out after about three weeks of good dry weather and you pull up plants in August, it's got pod, pods hanging on them and there's not a nodule to be found. That's because through that stress, that plant's burning energy to fill its pods, fighting the stress, and there's not enough leftover energy to feed the nodule, so the mother plant lets them go. But if you put on sugars, the more times you put on sugars, the first thing it does is send that sucrose sugar 
through a fantastic pathway right down to its nodules and says, hey, everything's all right, I'm gonna hold you. And it maintains them, keeps making nitrogen, feeds the plant throughout the season. If heat and drought stress are imminent, then put in ethylene inhibitors. The hotter and drier it gets, for two bucks an acre every 10 days, you can keep the stress down on a plant and make all kinds of extra bristles. Trust me, we've been doing it for years now. When you get that plant stress tolerant, or that uh, when you get that plant stress, if you're not fighting it, watch out for fungus and bugs, because as the sugars fall, nature comes in to take out the weak ones. And so you're gonna see bugs come in, insects come in, you're gonna see fungus come in. And if you're ready for that, you can put on insecticide, you can put on fungicides. And whenever you're doing that, common sense says, depending on my timing, I should be putting in some energy or some stress relief or little simple things that don't cost you big dollars can make you big returns on investment at this point. If corn stalks are actually present in the canopy underneath that you haven't got rid of because it's no-till, think about putting in some stubble digesting microbes. They have beneficial organisms now that can be sprayed right on there. And as they actually interact with that stalk and stubble, they break that cellulose and lignin down into carbon dioxide and it's released right out in the canopy. You got a canopy, you got stuff underneath it right before the canopy closes. If you got stalks, smart thing to start using some of these new microbes, they might cost you six, eight, maximum of $10 an acre. And you know they can put on big bushels. And when you're done and you go through with the combine, stalks are just eggshells. And so when you run the, the, the header through there, all those old corn stalks just blow to pieces and they don't give you any trouble anymore. They cut right through and go right through the machine. There's, there's no more issue. What you need to know about soybeans? Well, they're sugar machines and they're sensitive to the same issues as other plants with sugar losses. And they're also treated as a vine crop. This is a vine crop. So same way you'd grow watermelons or, or cucumbers or other vine things, uh, tomatoes, beans, they're vines. And so you treat them as vines. The soybeans will drop roots, flowers, and pods, and are far more susceptible to disease with a sugar loss. They also drop nodules, we talked about that. And as the season progresses, if pods are hanging on the stalk and sudden drops in sugar occur, it's funny when you get too hot and dry, you go out there and pull it back. What is that laying on the ground? Oh, those are pods. Lost the sugars, drop the pods. Adding the top set of pods, that's clear up on top, or keeping on racemes down underneath. If you've ever seen beans that start to reflower with little sets of like eight, 10, or 12 little brand new flowers on a little branch, that's called a raceme. And when you start feeding these energy levels and getting them up, those racemes magically start to form from the bottom of the plant where other pods have already formed and filled. If you can take these and understand how to keep the levels up under the canopy of that bean, you can add an additional six to 10 bushels on the top of the crop, boom, just like that. Whenever I see that top crop coming, I'm all over it. And I'm gonna show you a picture here why. Keeping that plant short and stopping the sugar losses preserves energy. Spraying sugars with any applications on the beans help preserve yield and nodules. R2 to R3 is the most used application timing for foliars. Why? What are we normally putting on? Either an insecticide or a fungicide. And I've still got a little canopy that I can get down through and I'm not running over stuff. And it's like, that seems to be the most obvious time. And they're in reproduction. So you can cause branches to, to start coming again or new flowers to come again and new pod sets. So that's where the most time is actually spent on passes that are being planned. So these late season apps with fungicide are very, very common. I got this from Bob Wagner. He's a, a guy that's been in the industry for more than 35 years out in Iowa. And he got this from Iowa State. And it's the uh, potential for abscission based on flowers and pods. And here's a little racine. You see there's, there's a, a little thing that's got four or five or six little pods developing. And it's showing you the percentage of the probability of that pod falling off. And of course, we, we all know that. We've gone out there and, you know, if you just lightly pull on it with your finger and your thumb on, on, a, on a new pod, if it pops right off, you know, it's aborting. And if, it's, if it resists you a little bit, it's still on there. Well, this gives you the point. If it's actually got seeds developing in it, there's a one, less than 1% chance it's going to drop that pod. If it's, a, if it's a pod developing with no seed production yet, it's a 3% chance it's going to drop. Then you see 40, 75, and one that's just finished, barely finished flowering, it's a 90%. If it's going to fall off, it's going to be that one. Well, that one requires the least amount of sugar to stay on. So all you got to do is go out there and spray sugars or humic acids or fulvic acids, energy levels on the plant to raise it within just a 24 hour period of this being formed, just like that. It sits, it stays, it holds. And it's a matter of filling it from that point forward. I get a group like this on top of a, on top of a uh, plant at the top node 
in the last three or four weeks of life, I can take it from something where there are pods that are no bigger than the one there that's that's 75 or 40 percent. And in less than two weeks, at the end of the season, that plant knows it's in high gear. We can turn the fully filled pods if we take care of them right. So that late season R4 to R5 is the same type of thing. Stress mitigation, energy conversion, water sugar movement, it's always the same with the soybean. It's burning energy like crazy. It's very inefficient. So what we got to do is just help it through. And nitrogen production and availability in the late season when you get all these pods on, We've got to keep the nodules on because 75% of that nitrogen to fill those pods is coming from fixation. We've got to keep those things on. Light interception and a clean canopy are critical. If that leaf is covered with fungus and everything else, that's just common sense. It's not going to be as efficient. If we keep the, the, the damage done, even with insect holes and, and fungal spores and, and chlor chlorotic spots, keep that stuff off, Keep the energy levels high, keep the stress levels down. Our energy efficiency is going up and we're filling pods like a rocket. And we had guys last year in our part of the world that got just a little bit of rain. And the normal averages for some of these great fields on those soils is 65. And where they were doing side-by-side -side trials with the system and they were had the untreated areas, they were 65 and tickled to death to get it. But where they put on a starter with some, some um, iron releasing microbes, two planned foliars with planned passes and one late season pass where the, the pods came in late and we got just a little cold in August. I said, let's, let's put on one final foliar pass to help knock out a little bit of uh, white mold and fill those pods. Those fields averaged 89.7 bushels side by side with the untreated that were the best that they expect, which is 65. They gained 25 bushels to the rim. Little incremental gains. Okay. Big rates of insecticide aren't as necessary if you keep the sugars up because you keep the sugars up, there's a limited amount of bugs that get in there and you don't need to blast it with, you know, pounds and pounds and pounds of insecticide. Just keep the sugars up. A little bit of insecticide goes a long way, keeps them out. If it's dry, then you got to use these sugars and or urea because urea is a foliar, remember, is an amine form or some amine or ammonium forms of foliar in. If you want to use something that we use commonly in corn, which is a product that I sell like Super 72, which is the triazone ureas, you can typically pick them up, pick them up at most anybody who sells uh, nutrition. The triazone ureas are a urea, a slow release urea, and a multiple slow release, a, a triple of sense of, of slow release. They will last over a period of a couple of weeks. Straight urea is going to go in overnight. Slow release urea is going to go in in a matter of the next seven to 10 days. And ultimately slow urea is gonna go in over the next two weeks. So you can spread that out. And so one to two gallons of that product sprayed over the top in your last application with some fungicide can go a long way to filling pods, okay? So let's summarize this. High yielding beans are an entire season event, not a pre-programmed dry fertilizer event. Doesn't mean that foliar or that, that dry fertilizer can't fill the bill. But dry fertilizer in and of itself is not going to give you consistently high yielding beans. It doesn't mean that they're not capable. If all the weather is right and you're getting seven, seven tenths or an inch of rain every seven to 10 days and your soil is in high gear, yeah, you know, if you've got all the nitrogen you need, you're going to have a whopper of a crop. But what happens when you get 19 inches like they do in Owensboro the last two or three years in a row in one month's time and you start washing all that fertility away? If all you did was rely on dry fertilizer and you're getting those kind of washing events, three and six and nine inch events, you can't keep enough nutrition around the roots. You've got to figure out some way to supplement that in a different fashion. So the multifaceted soil and foliar approach allows you to adjust to growing conditions and weather and makes you proactive. Instead of spending all the money up front and saying, oh, I hope everything goes well. If you have the equipment, which most of us have today, and if we don't, we have to pay, you know, the people who are out here doing our applications and make sure that they're carrying products that can fit. If they're not carrying products that don't fit, I, I wouldn't be wasting my money. Seriously, I mean, let's, let's get down to, to the brass tacks. Let's find out what we have. Let's find out what the people are doing for us and what they know. And if they have the products, it doesn't mean that you have to buy them from any specific place. You just need good information and good products to get the job done. Foliar feeding before rain. This is interesting dramatically improves the odds of big gains. If you actually foliar feed this soybean plant 
and it was a little bit unbalanced or low in energy. And you actually balance it with putting in chelated micronutrients and some other things along with sugars and, and stress relief. And you tell this plant, it's going to be okay. What happens is when you foliar feed, there's a signal that basically goes down from the top of that plant down to the roots that says, hey, somebody put some more stuff on us here. If you can send us some stuff from the roots, we're going to double up and we're going to make, we're going to take advantage of this little short term period and get a long term gain. That signal goes on for about 72 hours. And after 72 hours, it begins to diminish and it's gone. If now in that 72 hours, you've balanced the plant and it's doing this and you get a rainstorm, if you've had a little dry weather, or dry at all, I mean, the surface is dry. The dead microbes that were working that soil system actually have nutrients in their body and they've been release, releasing nutrients from the minerals and all that goes flushing into the plant. So all of a sudden, wow, you get this huge uptick of nutrition in the plant and it explodes in growth and flowers and pod set. Of course, the neighbors that are watching say, you know, I don't know what Charlie's doing down the road down there. I, that guy's nuts. But all of a sudden, they see what happens after they get Charlie gets the rain. What do they do? They go running down saying, well, maybe we're a little hard on Charlie. They go running down and they get some foliar feed. They come back and they let the soil dry out a little bit. And then they spray it. Then it stays dry for a week and nothing happens. Mm. Too late to the dance. Doesn't mean that you can't get it, anything. If you've got moisture still in the soil, there's a chance but the chances of getting the same response that Charlie got are slim to none. And I've watched this happen for years. I'm like, if you know with a certain amount of certainty that there's gonna be a rainstorm coming in, we never know them. But if the chances are good, if you can always spray in that 72 hour period, right before a rainstorm and the magic happens. Most people have the equipment to achieve it today, just not the knowledge and the product awareness to complete it. And the most important person that you can find to help you move into the future is a person who has kind of begun to grasp some of these pieces of the puzzle and is moving you forward. He is a true agronomist, uh, whether he, he may not even have an agronomy degree. I've got people that I've trained now for the last 20 years who never had one ounce of agronomy and they're always being tried, they're, they're always being offered jobs from major companies. Like, where did you learn all this? Which school did you go to? You know, and it's like, I don't have any school background. I mean, that befuddles them. I mean, that's the way history went for hundreds or thousands of years. We always got the people who knew the information and they trained the people behind them to move things forward. That's how the, the story moved forward. So all of the information isn't held at the universities, okay? It doesn't make universities a bad place. It just says practical application that you guys do year in and year out with some of the things that you're learning. There's always something to learn from everyone. It's not just always the people who go and spend their whole life studying issues. There are people who never have gone at all to school and they've raised a crop their entire life and they're darn good at it. And there are some people who know everything about a soybean who couldn't grow one if they had to. They can't even get this seed to come out of the ground. It's always the money's made in the middle when you understand how to take all that information and knowledge and put it together. And that's what I've, I've always, I've, I've oftentimes finished. I, I talk about the desert sojourner. The guy who was going out, he got caught in the desert. And he got lost and he's out here in the sand. And I mean, you know, the vultures are starting to circle and he's starting to go down. And in, this, in, the, in the distance, he sees a little, what looks like an oasis. And of course he realizes that probably something's playing with his mind. He gets a little closer as he's dragging himself to it. And he realizes, wait a minute, this doesn't look like an oasis or it does look like an oasis. And he gets, gets closer. Yeah, he's got palm trees and there's a little grass and some stuff. And, and he sees a little shack underneath a palm tree. And so he musters up the energy to get there. And when he gets there, he looks inside the shack and lo and behold, it's a well. It's a hand pump well. And he starts pumping on it really hard and, and nothing happens. I mean, it's just, oh, oh, there's no water in the well. And then he looks down and there's a rock and on the rock, there's a pitcher, a pitcher of water with a note behind it that says, take this water and pour some into the well. When you pour it into the well, the leather will swell and water will come forth. And when you're done, make sure to refill the pot for the next sojourner that comes by. Now, he's already tried it and he's scared because it's like, oh, no water. But he sees this and he's like, well, I got a choice to make. Hmm. Either I drink the water and this is all I get, or I take the chance and put a little water in here. 
Well, he realizes he's near death anyway. So it doesn't really matter. There's not enough water here in this pitcher to sustain him. So he says, well, I guess I'll give it a shot. So he pours a little water into the, down there and he starts pumping really hard. And all of a sudden, oh, 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 it starts to catch. The leather has swollen and all of a sudden, all the water he needs to stay here for as long as he needs to stay now, as long as he can find some food is coming. And he's filling up the pitcher and he sets it down there and he's just sitting there taking in the water. My question to you is what are you gonna do with the water? You got a lot of information here and I realize it's confusing. You can listen to this thing probably 50 times and still learn something on, on, on it. There's a lot of information and I didn't mean it to be simple because it's, it, is, it, is, it is direct and it's not exactly simple but there's a methodology to it. What are you gonna do with the water? Are you gonna take this information and say, I could have done this, but I just chose not to? Or are you gonna pour a little down the well and you're gonna learn, you're gonna learn from it a little bit? Because trust me, there's a lot of opportunity. There's a lot of crop opportunity to be gained from information like this and, and uh, seek out the people that you need to help you get that information. And if it's me, then we can get information. I mean, I, I, can, I can help you a little bit, but realize I'm limited because I do this all over the country. But if you need help, guys like Jeff, the folks there at, at Soybean Board, they're all starting to learn some of this information. And trust me, this will become a standard because it works and it works a lot. And um, when people realize that, you know, they've tried lots and lots of dry fertilizer and can't get anything to show up on a, on a yield map, and they start putting in something as simple as little 10 and 15 and 20 and $25 programs. And at the end of the year, where they've done these side-by-sides, it's funny how these boxes start to show up on the yield monitor for the very first time. And they haven't spent $200 an acre on dry fertilizer. They got the same old program they had and $25 worth of, of maybe some biostimulants or seed treatments and some foliars and just like that. Damn, got a yield box. Folks, that's all I got for you today. Um, there's a whole lot more where that came from, but I really wanna thank the Soybean Board and, and Kentucky Soybean Association for having me. Uh, it's, it's always a lot of fun. Um, if you can't tell, I do get excited about this. So poor Jeff, he's been trying to rein me in for years and get this stuff out to people. So thank you, Jeff, for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to speak today. Uh, thank you, Dan. Hey, we got one question here is sure. uh, if we could talk just a little bit more about the AMS breakdown mm -hmm. and when it needs to be applied to get the best response. Okay, there's a couple things that are involved there. I mean, most of the guys will put some AMS out at the start of the season. Um, because that allows us to get a little bit of the nitrogen actually into these young growing plants as an ammonium form, and it strengthens the plant and releases other nutrients. So I always recommend if you can, um, and you want to do this twice, put 100 pounds out prior to planting, whether it's you know two or three weeks or prior to planting or even right at planting, because it'll help sustain the growth of that plant. And then before the canopy closes, if you can, put on another uh, uh, 50, 75, or 100 pounds before the canopy closes. Now I realize that's gonna add some expense uh, and it is gonna require rain because this is like a, a 15, 30 and 45 day program that if we get you know, rainfall events happening in cycles, the ammonium sulfate will break down and it will actually be a stable nitrogen form. It does not convert very readily easily to nitrate. It just stays as ammonium. So if you're trying to get late season nitrogen, that's a really big challenge. Uh, and it's not very easy to accomplish with dry ammonium sulfate unless you can get it, you know, spread out there. You don't want it sitting on the plant. You get a little bit of burn, but if you can get it washed off, um, you got to get the timing right because if it takes 15 to 30 days to break out and you're trying to get it within a matter of, you know, three or four or five days, it doesn't work that way. That's why urea was tried initially years ago. And urea is fine as long as it gets melted pretty quickly and runs down in and gets into the plant immediately. But if urea sets in the soil and it breaks down, it turns to what? It turns to nitrates. And then so you get nitrogen and get color, but you don't get yield, you get fine growth. So urea is, a, is, a, is real risky. Now, if you use ESN, a little different story, you can use some ESN, but ammonium sulfate gives you the opportunity to get sulfur into these plants. Most of us need about 40 pounds of total sulfur as sulfate sulfur to make a good high top end crop. Your soil test and analysis is gonna come back to you. You're gonna find on an average, they have around, um, somewhere between a maximum of 10 and 20 pounds of actual sulfate uh, in your soil by, by nature. So if you use hundred pounds, that's 24 pounds of sulfate. 150 would be 36 pounds. You put out 150 one time. And if you had to make a choice of only one time during the year, I would put 150 down right at or right before planting. And that would help you manage on into the season. Um, and if you wanna use AMS as a part of your foliar pro or your, uh, 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 
herbicide programs. You know, if you're going to use AMS in there, you don't get very much, but every little bit of AMS would help. And some guys have gone to putting in potassium thiosulfate or a little bit of ammonium thiosulfate with some sugars to get some extra sulfur. There are ways you can do it. They're not quite as efficient as putting out 150 pounds of, of dry ammonium sulfate. But my number one choice typically in these whole issues is to try to put it on sometime right around that planting event if I can. Okay. Um, I don't see anything else. Uh, Dan, we certainly appreciate your time today. It's been extremely informative. Um, I know you've got a lot of guys out there that are uh, probably kind of scratching their heads a little bit. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. and, that's a, and that's a good thing because that's, that's right. what we need to be doing. That's right. So, um, if, Just don't, um, don't make yourself bleed. Don't scratch too hard. Yeah. <laughs> but pick up the phone and call. And you know what? Educate the people around you. Um, like I said, ignorance is, is excusable. I, I, the, the pride is what we deal with in this industry. There's a, it's a very proud industry. And there are a lot of people that don't want to hear what you have to tell them. But you tell them, please, all I'm asking you is to do your homework. I'd gladly support you and do a lot more stuff with you if you can help me figure this thing out. You need to help those people that don't know yet what's going on dig into this. All the stuff that I've, I've presented today is researched. It's been researched at the universities one way or the other. It's not like we're making this stuff up. And as you do your homework and you find it's out there and you integrate it, because that's the missing piece. Help the people who you buy your products from learn to integrate and everybody's going to win. They're going to sell more. You're going to be happier. Everybody's going to be happy. Okay. All right. Uh, just one last. Uh, if you are needing the CCA credits, um, uh, you'll that'll be made available where you can, uh, can attain those credits. That's a... Um, and um, again, if, uh, if you're not a member or need to renew, just call the office uh, here at 270-365-7214 or go on the website. Uh, this will be, will be posted to the website here by tomorrow. And um, we appreciate, uh, if you have any for future workshops, uh, you can go on the website. If you don't know who your representatives are on the Kentucky uh association uh you can go on the website and, and all the board members are listed so uh, uh get a hold of one of them if you've got an idea or got some comments or something we, we can make uh your association work better for you so uh, we thank you dan thank you again and be looking forward to talking to you here real soon on a personal level <laughs> and um, we hope everybody has a great day thank you you're welcome